Rick the Venture Crew Leader. We hate him! <laughs> we hate him! <laughs> Hello friends and welcome back to Red X, your source for the freshest daily Reddit content anywhere on the internet. Promise swearsies, it's science, just go look it up. <laughs> Anyways, today we are jumping right back into r slash neckbeard stories with a classic, an absolute banger for you guys. It has been six years to the day since Sir Samwell was introduced to the internet by one user, Lady Saber. It's going to be beefy, but uh, I'm ready for it. My computer's ready for it. So let's go ahead and just jump right into this thing. The introduction of good Sir Samuel, or why my stomach now turns at the smell of spaghetti sauce. Hi, everyone. It's Lady Saber back with story number two. Pause. Story number one from Lady Saber is actually in the transgender neckbeards video on my channel. If you'd like to go look that up. Anyways, this story will very likely have more installments. Oh, yes. Player one is me, Lady Saber, 16 at the time. I'm Finnish, grew up in Belgium, here in America on a two-year exchange program. At this time, I'm still new to the country and school and going through a bit of culture shock. I'm heavy into fencing. It's been my sport for something like 10 years. For neckbeards, this seems to make me the katana-wielding milady of their wet dreams. Player 2 is smooth cheek neckbeard. We'll call him Samuel Tarly, just because they've got to be twins. Ooh. Fat as all get out, wears cargo shorts, bazinga shirts, sandals, and yes, of course, the fedora. He also smells like sweat and old spaghetti sauce. <laughs> and he has a really high-pitched nasally voice that sounds like a whiny toddler. But in this story, he's still going to have the uh, classic neckbeard voice. Player 3 is John. He shares half of my courses and is really good at chess. He has a southern accent that I could listen to all day. I'm keeping his description limited so that I don't sound like an obsessive bitch. <laughs> I met Samwell at chess club. I'm pretty aware that it's a neckbeard spawn point by now, but I go because I like to play. There are some good apples, like John, so I was there mostly just to talk with him. Today, however, he's running late and he gets upstaged by Samwell. I'm setting up the board and the seat across from me is empty, so Samwell asks to play. I tried to politely turn him down, telling him that I was waiting for someone. Sam then replies with, Well, I don't see him. And I grind my teeth a little at that. Samwell plops right into the chair. He introduces himself with a tip of the fedora. I wish I was kidding. I'm not aware of the neckbeard stereotype at this point, otherwise I probably would have lost it right there. <laughs> I play with Samwell, though, rather than excuse myself. And it quickly becomes clear that he's not familiar with most of the special rules of chess. He accuses me of cheating on more than one occasion. First, when I make an en passant capture, and then when I castle queenside. He also tries to castle out of check. It is profoundly annoying. Not because of what he's doing, I mean I'm perfectly willing to teach a new player the rules, but because he's so certain that he's right about it. He reminds me a lot of Michael Scott from The Office, just generally throwing a fit and whining like a child when he's wrong, except way more annoying and way more cringy. Sam was trying to make conversation with me. I'm not really sure what about because I can't stand to listen to his voice. He's swearing like a sailor, I guess trying to sound edgy, but with his voice he just sounds like another kid on Xbox Live. <laughs> I'm not able to tune his food out, however. In the middle of our game, he breaks out this all-you-can-eat buffet of pastas, raviolis, and God knows what else, all packaged up in Tupperware. Thanks, Mom! <laughs> My food etiquette is probably a little uptight compared to most Americans, but this was just obscene. He's shoveling it in mid-sentence, chewing and smacking with his mouth open, spilling stuff on himself. Oh, God! The food by itself smells like death and his face hole wasn't making things any better. Meat sauce residue moves from spoon to face to fingers to chest pieces with alarming speed. We get closer and closer to the end of the game, and Samwell takes longer and longer to move, even when he only has one possible move that he can make. Enter John, finally. He sees me playing with Samwell and looks a little hurt that he's been upstaged, but he's content to just watch. I can tell John is put off by the smell too. John and I get a small side conversation going and Samwell is eyeing us back and forth. Samwell asks if John is my boyfriend. Awkward, because this is only going two ways. Either yes, we're dating and you're the third wheel, or we aren't dating and... 
still awkward. John and I laugh nervously, and I tell him no. Chivalry ensues. (laughs) Why don't you have a boyfriend? Well, I haven't been here very long. Oh, okay. Well, when you do, just make sure you watch out for all the assholes and douchebags at this school who don't know how to really treat a lady. For the record, I was already well acquainted with the nice guy TM mentality. Call it morbid curiosity, but I decided to press the topic with Samwell. What do you mean? Well, lots of guys, unlike myself, just treat women like objects. Most women have never been treated like a woman by a good guy. I'm not exaggerating this quote by an inch. It is forever etched into my memory like a spaghetti stain on white pants. John is standing to the side and slightly behind Samwell, cocking his head a bit, giving me the, is this guy for real eyes? I can see the train coming down the tracks, so I try to change the subject, but my good gentle sir cannot neglect to impose upon my lady his philosophies. Most girls don't realize how beautiful they are, especially without makeup, so they degrade themselves to get the attention of guys who (laughs) don't deserve them anyways. Like, I bet if you didn't wear so much makeup, you could get a boyfriend like that. Three tries later, he snapped his fingers. Probably slick with spaghetti sauce. (laughs) I went from cringe to rage pretty quickly, ended up making a stupid mistake, and the game ended in a stalemate, which Sir Sam treated like a world champion victory. There's not enough time left in lunch to play another game with John, but still too much time to leave early. I politely decline a handshake with Samwell and stand to talk with John. Samwell, sensing that he's needed in our conversation, hauls himself from his seat. There's really only a narrow lane between the chess tables and computers. Two people can stand face to face, but three people of normal girth would have trouble. Talk about an elephant in the room. Sam sidles up next to me, mouth breathing and sweating, injecting himself into our conversation like a bad batch of heroin. I don't remember how, but fencing comes up, and Sir Samwell's eyes go big. Whoa, you fence, like, with swords? That's so cool. Where do you fence at? I get this question a lot more than you might think. Most people don't really know much about the sport in the U.S., so this is a pretty harmless way of stimulating conversation about it. I didn't really think much about it, and eventually I just gave him the contact info for the gym that I go to. I doubted that he'd ever go past googling it. At most, maybe give it to someone else. My coaches here are really fantastic people, so I do try to promote them as much as possible. Holy ravioli. I was in for a shock. Fencing practice is coming up next. I don't understand why OP doesn't like the smell of Italian food. I mean, I guess it can be a bit overpowering if you've got a table full of it. Or if Sir Samuel's mom makes ravioli, like, with shit inside. (laughs) Which is essentially what it sounds like to me in this story. I think the way he was eating was probably more offensive than the actual smell of the food, you know. Eating is really primal, and it involves basically four senses. But Sir Samuel, being the big brain that he is, decided to get touch involved as well. (laughs) (laughs) I cannot wait to see what happens at fencing practice, so let's get into it. Sir Sam tries to sword, or why I can no longer have neckbeard free time. Hello, gentle sirs and miladies. This will be the second installment of Sir Samwell. You might want to read up on Samwell in my previous stories if you aren't familiar with his dazzling charm. Player one, me, Lady Saber, LS, still 16, foreign exchange student, undergoing extensive culture shock therapy, Very avid fencer, been doing it for about 10 years. Player 2 and 3 are my fencing coaches, immigrants from Hungary. Really fantastic people, husband and wife couple. Mr. Coach is a big guy, with a thunderstorm of a voice. Mrs. Coach is petite, but still yells louder than Mr. Coach. (laughs) Is spooky quick, and always gives one-on-one instruction with people, even in group lessons. Minor characters, but they rock. Player 4 is Sir Samwell Smoothcheeks. How I wish it wasn't. (laughs) Fat, sweaty mouth breather, usually smells like death. Typical attire includes grungy graphic tees, sandals, and cargo shorts with pockets full of old pasta and meat sauce. (laughs) Either that or he bathes in it. I'm not sure, but the smell is pungent. Sir Sam's mother, Mrs. Sam, is a minor character, but she shows up more often down the line, so I'll detail her. Curly hair, feminine build, wears mom jeans, very warm and friendly. I guess this is stereotypical of suburban white moms. The story occurs about a week after my last encounter with Sir Sam. To recap, last time I gave him the contact info for my fencing class. 
Might as well have given Sauron the ring, too. I want to give a bit of context first. When I'm practicing, I make zero attempt at my appearance. Makeup of any kind will mix with sweat and turn into acne soup on my face, so I go without. My hair is done up in a bun, and my boobs are squished into a sports bra. Seriously, guys, it's very unladylike. Anyways, practice starts at 5pm and ends at 7.30pm. I'm there earlier to use the gym and go running before class, usually for about 45 minutes. Today, I run, making two circuits around the cross-country track, and I make it back to the building with maybe 10 minutes before class. And there he is. Sir Sam lumbers from the back seat of a minivan, and my heart lurches. He's actually wearing sneakers in lieu of his typical sandals, but he's not without his cargo shorts, a Call of Duty shirt, and fingerless gloves. I think that neckbeards always wear a certain minimum of neckbeard gear. <laughs> oh, and that fedora? Yeah, he had a different one. It was some kind of awful reddish color. I have a suspicion that it started out as white, and he had just used it as a ravioli receptacle. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> I think his mouth is the main ravioli receptacle. The hat's just a backup. As I make my approach back to the building, he gives me a full arm wave. He says something as I run by, but I keep going through the double doors to the gym area to walk a lap as a cool down and take a drink of water. I'm running on a solid high of endorphins. I'm finishing my lap when Sir Sam makes his grand entrance. He tries pulling the door and then pushes it open by thrusting his shoulder against it. He stumbles inside, panting from Lord knows what. <laughs> Moving. Sir Sam is miffed. What the hell was that all for? What do you mean? You just ran right fucking past me and you didn't wave back? Why the hell would you invite me here if you didn't want to talk to me? Sorry, Sam. I was just in my groove. He stays mad and fee fi fo fums over to the water fountain. <laughs> the tall one doesn't work. And the short one puts out a stream that you can't really get a drink from without suckling the spout. So he gives up on that and turns to me, asking if I have any water. I still don't know what for. I contemplate letting him touch his face hold of my water bottle and likely backwash into it. I'm feeling a little intimidated by him though, so I offer him the one that I drank from. It's almost empty anyways, and I think a bottle of bleach might be enough to clean it. <laughs> no way! You already drank from that one! I know, gross, right? <laughs> Before this escalates, Mr. and Mrs. Coach come out of the office area to see who's making a fuss. Mrs. Coach introduces herself to Sir Sam and his mother, who has parked and now come inside. A few other people are now trickling in. We have about a half a dozen regulars in the advanced class, and ten or so who are beginners. Mrs. Coach takes Sir Sam back to the equipment room to get him a set of gear. Mrs. Sam turns to me. Are you Lady Saber? Um, yeah. How do you know my name? Sir Sam's told me all about you. Fantastic. Oh, okay. He says you two got to be really good friends at school. I bet he did. I'm about to explain that we played one strained chess game before Mr. Coach comes and calls me for warm-ups. We line up side by side for stretching. Guess who's to my right? Both classes are taught in the same room, so I resign myself to having him hover near me for the rest of the evening. Stretches became a horror show. Everyone has varying flexibility. The idea is really to just untie all of your muscles and ligaments so we can practice. For Sir Sam, it's a competition. He nearly gave himself an aneurysm reaching his knees, and practicing lunges was even worse. I have a very long lunge. My hips drop down nearly to the floor, and my back leg is fully extended. It's weird, and it has its drawbacks, but it's just my thing. Sir Sam tried this once and fell over. Pretty sure that registered on the Richter scale. <laughs> oh, did I mention he's still wearing the fedora? Because, yeah, he's still wearing the fedora. Eventually, it gets too cringy even for Mr. Coach, who finally tells him to set it aside. This continues for a whole goddamn hour. Sir Sam has pretty much given up on trying to talk to me. He's huffing and puffing, red-faced, and soaking himself in sweat. I feel a little sorry for him putting in all this effort to not get laid. <laughs> Footwork practice was also hard to watch. If you want to get a picture of what Sir Sam looked like, just imagine King Arthur from Monty Python doing his gallop. Got it? Okay, now imagine that King Arthur is a hippopotamus, about three french fries and a Diet Coke away from a heart attack. <laughs> That's what it looked like. Just relish that for a moment. <laughs> After warm-ups, we're supposed to do drills. These are designed to improve your technique. 
Before, though, we change into our fencing uniforms with all the protective gear. Usually, we all change in the gym, being that no one is actually getting naked. I, however, am in no mood to have Sir Sam see me in any form of undress, so I gather up my wad of clothes and hit the lockers. When I get back, Sir Sam is still dressing himself. The snug-fitting knickers won't accommodate both of his hams and his oversized cargo shorts. I didn't want to watch, but I couldn't look away. <laughs> Getting his jacket on was equally difficult. His arms just don't bend that way. Mrs. Coach is standing right there with him, helping the good sir dress like a loyal squire. <laughs> After all this, he whines about having to wear the fencing glove instead of his own fingerless wonder grippers. These are better designed for traction. I wish I was joking. <laughs> the legitimate fencing glove was unacceptable as well, being too tight and making my head have claustrophobia. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Eventually, though, he sucked it up. We paired off for drilling. Sounds twisted. I'm sorry. <laughs> These... <laughs> These tend to be specific to the weapon that you're using. I'm making it worse, aren't I? So, foil fencers work with foil fencers, epes work with epes, you get the idea. The saber group is an odd number, so the three of us decide to rotate, so we each take a turn. Sir Sam is quite distant, being in the beginning foil group. It's almost like I finally have my sport back to myself. Yeah, as if. The foil group is also an odd number, so Sam slinks away from them and approaches me. I'm saved by the call to switch for 10 minutes until I rotate out. Sir Sam is waiting for me. Hello, Lady Sable. Has anyone ever told you you look really good in... He pauses here for a second, like he didn't think this compliment through before finishing... That... that... that jacket? At first I took it as a genuine compliment, until he raises his weapon. My mask isn't down, so this totally freaks me out and I think I might have yelled. And he makes a jab at my chest. He didn't connect. I brought my blade up, caught his weapon on the outside, and rotated my blade in a circle. He let go, and his foil goes skittering across the floor into a wall. What'd you do that for? Sir Sam yell squeaks. He goes very quickly from scared to angry. Mr. Coach comes over asking what happened. Lady Sable just knocked the sword out of my head for no freaking reason. Mr. Coach turns to me. I'm sorry, he just made an extension at me when my mask was up, and I reacted. Mr. Coach gives Sam a glare. I didn't mean to. I, I was just playing. I have the urge to offer cheese with that wine. Mr. Coach is pretty pissed and tells Sam to pick up his weapon. He saunters away and avoids me, finally, for the rest of the practice. I got to finish the last 45 minutes in peace. I almost forgot he was there, until I'm peeling off my sweat-drenched uniform. My face is flushed, my legs are sore, I smell like a wet dog. Everything's going great. Cue Sir Sam. He comes up behind me while I'm wiggling out of my knickers. Do you need some help there, miss? I turn around to see what the whitest night doth require, and he looks like he's been out in a rainstorm. His shirt is drenched, his thick cargo shorts are soaked with ball sweat, <laughs> and his hair under his fedora looks like a used mop. He might be a festering corpse for his stench. I hold my breath while I pull my knickers off in the least sexual way possible. I leave my high fencing socks because I was not bending down or taking a knee in front of him to remove them. Spaghetti breath is still panting. I pack my stuff into my bag and stand up to go, praying that my ride will be outside. Sir Sam stands in front of me. I'll take that for you. Indicating my wheeled carry bag. It's okay, I got it, Sam. Please, I insist. He grabs the handle with his sausage fingers. I let him take the handle, just wanting to be out of there. We're both waiting for the other to go until he says, After you, my lady. <laughs> I walk with him trailing behind me, and I make a quick glance in the mirror. Sure enough, this Creeposaurus Rex is staring straight at my ass without a care in the world. Also, my top is halfway translucent from sweat. Awesome. My ride isn't outside yet. Even though I'm 16, I can't get a license and drive in America for liability reasons, so I have to wait for my host family to come pick me up. Sir Sam's mother is here though, but he doesn't leave. I tell him thanks for carrying my stuff, and he offers to wait with me to make sure I get home safe. It is pitch dark out, but Mr. and Mrs. Coach aren't leaving until last. Mrs. Sam pulls up next to us and rolls down the window. Time to go, Sir Sam! Hi, Lady Saber! I'll be there in a minute, Mom. I just want to make sure Lady Saber gets home safe. 
Mrs. Sam gives a chuckle and pulls into a parking place further down the lot. Oh, please come back. I want to be safe, remember? Out of the blue, Sir Sam says, My mom's such a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what? Why would you say that? Because she's always doing stupid shit like that. Getting up in my business. Tearing down your mom. A plus way to converse with a milady. He leans back. With ninja stealth, he slides his hand along the concrete behind the small of my back. I turn my head and glance, letting him know that I see. Those high socks are killing me right now. Great. Now I'm satisfying my gentle sir's kinks. My ride was about 15 minutes late, but it felt like as many hours. Finally, I see the headlights. I get up to grab my bag on the other side of Sir Sam and realize quickly that he has no intention of handing it to me. Instead, expecting me to bend over and pick it up. I'll either have to bend at the waist or squat to lift with my knees. He's just looking at me with an innocent smile. Can you give me the handle to my bag? I carried it all the way out here for you, Lady Saber. <laughs> Don't be so lazy. I am absolutely not going to put on a lap dance for this great white whale. His smirk is getting wider as my ride pulls through the roundabout. Finally, though, finally, I have a witty comeback. I hook my foot under the handle, give it a little kick upwards and into my hand. I flash a smile and strut my stuff to the car. What? Oh, you thought I was done? Cute. Wait till fencing part two. It gets worse. Much worse. <laughs> also, if you have any questions about the fencing stuff I mentioned, just ask. I cut out a lot of information to prevent this story from becoming a fencing lesson rather than a neck ham story. God, that is absolutely wild, isn't it? I carried it all the way out here for you. Don't be lazy. What? <laughs> Bro, finish the job that you started. Pick it up. Put it in my car. I guess I'm glad Lady Saber, like, kind of knew what he was doing. God, I probably wouldn't have thought twice about it. Just grab the bag and GTFO, but she called him on it. She didn't give him the satisfaction, so that's at least a small win in my book. I suppose we shall see what happens in part number three. Chivalrous Sam phones a friend part one, or why winning anything has never sucked so much. This will be the third installment of Sam the Chivalrous. Player one is me, Lady Saber, 16 at the time, foreign exchange student here on a two-year program, undergoing culture shock, and suffering chronic cringe pain from daily interactions with Sam. Player two is Samuel Spaghetti Breath, king of the Anelli, the Ravioli, and the Fettuccini, lord of the Sandal Socks, and protector of the Miladies. Complete lard, wears cargo shorts, Minecraft hoodie, New Balance sneakers, and an Argyle fedora. He reeks like the garbage disposal at an Italian restaurant. <laughs> Supporting character 3 is John, previously identified as Cute Boy. Slightly taller than Sam, he and I share a lot of common interests, or are at the very least interested in each other's interests. While we're not dating yet, it's definitely headed in that direction. He and his family are from Louisiana, so he speaks passable French, with a funny accent that I make fun of often. AskFred.net is an online registration system used to sign up for fencing tournaments. It's a great tool to see who's going to be at the tournament and how many fencers will attend. This story takes place the Sunday after Sam's first fencing lesson at a local tournament. It's a rather large event with a great mix of fencers. My coaches regularly send email updates to our group with upcoming tournaments, and of course, Sam is on this list. After a few days of school and minor cringy run-ins with Sam, I'm looking forward to a Sunday of competing for the first time in a long time, and the first time in America. The Sabre event is in the afternoon, foils in the morning, and epis in between. I register on Ask Fred a few days prior. John has expressed an interest in fencing, so he's tagging along to watch this tournament. It's about an hour drive, so we sit in the back seat and talk shit about our classes. Both he and my host mother don't know much about fencing tournaments, so I'm also waxing eloquent on that subject. Regarding my appearance, I'm almost a polar opposite of how I present myself in practice. I do my hair in loose pigtails, apply eyeliner and blush, generally get dolled up. The makeup that I use deals really well with sweat, but it's expensive, so I only wear it to tournaments. The purpose here is to look innocent and harmless. It throws off the competition, and I look great in my medal photos. We arrive right on time, as Epe's finishing up and awarding medals. The last competitors are stumbling out, sweaty and gross, grinning like idiots on their victory rush. This tourney is being held in a dusty downstairs dojo, pretty upscale as far as tournaments go. It smells like fermenting sweat and vaguely like marinara sauce. 
I sign in at the registration desk before descending. The marinara sauce should be a clue, OP. Turn around, run! <laughs> but she didn't, and of course, there he is. Sir Sam perched atop the bleachers, staring into my soul from across the room. His fedora is covering a mass of dried sweat and grease that might have once been hair. Sam hails me with both a full-armed wave and the tip of the fedora, like he can't quite decide which one will win Milady's heart. He gets to his feet and jog gallops down the bleacher steps, meeting me halfway. John, who had been walking behind me, draws up on my left. Hi, Lady Saber. <laughs> you look quite ravishing today. I'm about to say thanks and move on when John cuts in. Yeah, she does, in a warm tone of voice, and lays a hand on my elbow. It turns into a Mexican standoff while these two rooster people suck in their breath and puff out their chests. Muck, muck, muck. <laughs> I shoulder my way past Sam with John beside me, set my stuff down against the wall, and warm up with some stretches. John sits on the bleachers next to me, and we talk about Sam. I'm not sure if Sam was actually here to fence, and just stayed another three hours to watch me fence, or if he saw that I was signed up and dropped in. Both prospects are equally discomforting. Sam is still standing in the middle of the room, trying to contain his anger that his chivalry was slighted by some douchebag. His nightly intuition must have indicated that I needed saving from the unchivalrousness of John. Because he joins our conversation. Are you here to fence today? No, I came for aromatherapy. Oh, hey Sam. Yeah, I'm gonna do Saber in a bit. Cool beans. <laughs> you look good today. Are you wearing makeup? Here we go. Uh, yeah. Indeed, that's a pity. You shouldn't need to. I think natural beauty's the best way to go. I smile awkwardly and nod, trying to work my way out of my own head so I can perform today. Sam opens his mouth to say something when John cuts him short. Sam, Lady Saber's trying to warm up. John, Lady Saber and I are trying to conversate. Can you not butt into our discussion, please? John shakes his head and looks away. I finish my stretching routine, still a long way from my groove and dress into my uniform while Sam sizes me up. He is making my skin crawl. In most fencing tournaments, there are two rounds of competition. The first, called pools, splits everyone off into groups of four to six. You fence everyone in your pool to get a feeling of how everyone is fencing that day. All the bouts are to five points. The pools are distributed so that players with a lettered rank are evenly split among lower ranked and unranked fencers. After pools, everyone is seated into a bracket for direct elimination. These bouts are to 15 points, the loser's knocked out, and the winner advances. The ranking system goes from A, professional, Olympic, general, expert level, down to E, which is novice. Under E rank, there's U, which is unranked. U fencers are highly unpredictable, as it only really means that they haven't competed very much or haven't competed recently. Someone can practice for 10 years without competing, and they'll still be a U. In this case, because I had not competed in America before, my rating was a U. I'll answer more questions about this in the comment, but we gotta keep the story moving. My first pool bout played right into my hands. My opponent was ranked E, and it had clearly gone to his head. He swaggers onto the strip, sizing me up. I play silly, tossing my hair and looking overly excited and nervous. When we come on guard, I score my first touch quickly. I act surprised, ask the ref, did I get it? My opponent's a little miffed, but tries again. I land a touch on the side of his mask, hits like this make your ears ring, and he makes a frustrated noise. Next, I hit him hard on the cuff. He realizes by now that I'm a little more than I appear to be, but can't compensate, and the bout ends 5-0. and oh. I flounce and eagerly shake his hand. Sir Sam is up in the bleachers, cheering for me, way louder than he realizes. It's more obnoxious than enthusiastic and really cringeworthy because he's pretty much the only person cheering. <laughs> he yells encouragements the whole time like, Get him, Lady Saber! And, Yeah, that's my girl! The pattern is the same for the next four bouts. It's about as helpful as a back pocket on a shirt. <laughs> it's a great saying. Finally, pools are finished. There's some downtime between the pools and direct eliminations while the referees turn in score sheets and everyone is seated. Sir Sam takes this chance to woo my lady. He approaches me looking overly excited with his fedora in one hand, waving it like a slimy, wriggling fish. You fenced really well, Lady Saber. Thanks, Sam. You know, I noticed that John wasn't cheering you on at all. You probably didn't see, but I was the whole time. 
That's because I told John how annoying it is when you're competing. Yeah, I heard. It's usually better if you don't make so much noise. It can be really distracting on the strip. Sam looks dejected for a moment before getting visibly mad. You know, I was just trying to help you. You don't have to be so rude about it just because I'm distracting you. I didn't have to stay at this tournament all day just for you, Lady Saber. I'm just being nice. I wish I had a pocket full of cookies to give you, Sam, for being such a nice guy, trademark. After enduring this tirade of supreme kindness, it's time for direct eliminations. I seeded well, so my first few matches are easy. Sir Sam, of course, takes a seat behind me and moves seats between bouts, often crossing the room, to be consistently sitting behind me. And of course, he continues to cheer with all the gusto of a squealing piglet. I never quite find a rhythm, and I lose the final bout, taking a silver medal and earning a rank of E. Sir Sam is totally thrilled. I don't think he's ever felt more responsible for someone else's victory than in this moment. He shambles towards me, going for a hug, which I turn into a handshake, quickly reconsider, and turn it into a fist bump. <laughs> he shakes the fist <laughs> He shakes the fist vigorously. Keep in mind that I'm standing for a medal photo with the three other medalists while all of their friends, family, and coaches are taking pictures. The result is a photobomb of Hiroshima proportions, which I would post here in a heartbeat if it didn't involve revealing both of our faces. Sam realizes that he's made a no-no when he turns to see a phalanx of camera phones awaiting his swift exodus. He tries to play it off, removing his fedora in a sweeping bow like, Hey, I'm a medalist too, <laughs> Look, I'm with the medal winners in their picture. So funny. He has a cartoonish, nervous smile pasted on, which is quickly wiped away as the crowd starts to jeer him out of the shot. He tries to walk away with his pride. <laughs> and failed. He keeps his distance while I remove my uniform and pack up to leave. As I head for the door, though, I'm intercepted by Sam, much in the way that an actual Sam might intercept a jumbo jet full of orphans. <laughs> Hey, Lady Saber, can I ask you a favor? Can I refuse? <sighs> what is it, Sam? Well, I need a ride home. What do you mean? Isn't your mom coming to pick you up? Or are you tired of having her get up in your business? Well, she dropped me off, but I didn't know what time I needed to have her pick me up, so I was hoping you could just give me a ride. Ah, very clever, Sam. Very clever ploy indeed. Only a master strategist like yourself could conjure such a flawless plan to spend more time with my lady. Sorry, Sam, but my car only has room for John and I to sit. Oh, oops. Well, how am I supposed to get home then? I don't know, Sam, but I really can't help you. Okay, fine. Guess I'm just not deserving of a simple ride home. Um, what? Sam, I just told you. There's not enough room and Whatever, Lady Saber. Can I just use your phone to call my mom? I give him my phone, and he makes an exasperated call home. In listening to the one-sided dialogue, it sounds like he told his mom in advance that I would be taking him home. He hangs up and gives me my phone back with an addition of sweat crust and stalks off without another word. John, my host mother, and I pile into the car and make our drive home. I had not seen or heard the last of him that day, but that's coming up next. I'm going to tell you right now, never give a neckbeard your phone. You know what's going to happen? I know what's going to happen. <laughs> and I love how uh, she's like, hey, could you not cheer because it's distracting me? And he's like, I'm going to cheer even louder. <laughs> that was the problem. You weren't cheering loud enough. Brilliant. Just brilliant. But I guess these are the sort of high IQ plays that we've come to expect from neckbeards. Anyways, let's see what the next story holds. <laughs> Sir Sam phones a friend part two, or why I got two hours of sleep a night during exam week. This will be the fourth installment of Sir Sam the Chivalrous, and likely a much shorter read than the others. Player one is me, Lady Saber, 16, for an exchange student, going through some stress about midterm exams before Christmas break. Also, a very light sleeper. Player two is Sir Sam the Chivalrous. All around Beatus beard, smells like a putrid puttanesca, probably bathes in meat sauce. While I have no in-person contact with Sir Sam for this story, I imagine that he wears all of his fedoras at once while using his phone to boost his chivalry level. <laughs> this story spans most of exam week, beginning the night of Sam's first fencing tournament and ending the following Thursday. It's Sunday night, 
I've gotten home from the tourney, showered, had dinner, and gotten in bed. I feel good, finally able to relish my victory in peace. I fall asleep quickly around 11 o'clock or so. As I mentioned above, I'm a light sleeper. I'll often wake at bumps and noises in the night, or even loud noises in my dream, stare around for 15 seconds, and go right back to sleep. Tonight, I wake to the buzzing of my phone. New text from some unknown number. It's probably spam, so I go back to sleep. Later, more buzzing. Same number. I unlock my phone, squint like an Asian in the Caribbean that gets the brightness, and fumble to the new text. Hey, what's up? Can't sleep. How are you? It's 12.30 a.m. What the hell? I take the bait and respond, who is this? <laughs> well, hello to you too, Lady Saber. Can't believe you don't know who this is, though. Sad face. Seriously? It's like 1 a.m. Tell me who this is or I'm blocking this number. Okay, okay. Sure, it, it's Sam. That's all the answer I need. I switch my phone off and try to fall asleep again before getting back up and responding with, How did you get this number? Oh, well, when I called my mom this afternoon, I accidentally called myself first. So I just had your number in my phone and I decided to text you. Smiley face. Dude. Sam, I have a midterm in world history tomorrow. I need to sleep. That's cool. I'm studying anatomy, winky face. Why do I even try? I turn my phone off and go back to sleep. Yet like I'm in some well-timed nightmare, my phone goes off again shortly thereafter. I try to ignore it, but it keeps going. He's calling me. I silence the call, go back to a fitful sleep until I get another call. I pick up, probably sounding like a drunk schmeagle. Hello. Hey, Lady Saber. Sam? <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't sleep. Hey, what a coincidence. Me neither. We must be soulmates or something. Sam, I have a test tomorrow. What do you want? Nothing. Just thought you might want someone to talk to. Did you get home safe this afternoon? <laughs> Duh. I know someone who won't be very safe going home. Yeah, fine. Sam, I need to sleep. I end the call and look at the clock. It's 4.30. I have to be up in an hour to be on time. I don't dare switch my phone into do not disturb mode, else I'll miss my wake up alarm. Texts come trickling in. I feel like crying, or screaming, or just laughing hysterically. I can't go back to sleep, so I stare at the ceiling for an hour while my phone buzzes like it's on a cocaine high. I eventually drag myself out of bed and try in vain to cover the bags under my eyes. I do mediocre on the test, coming very close to dropping a letter grade in the class. The next night, same thing. I have a dozen new texts coming in every few hours. Some are short messages, some are the beginnings of an academic paper. I get a lot of picture messages, random funny memes, and rage comics. It's 2012, guys. <laughs> as well as pictures of the final score in his Call of Duty multiplayer matches. God. <laughs> They seem to pick up at night too, like he draws energy from gallons of monster and streaming gigabytes of Sasha Grey and Asa Akira. I'm not sleeping a wink, my eating is off, I have manic bursts of energy followed by hours of uselessness. Ooh, feel that. <laughs> On Tuesday night, I turn my phone all the way off. I slept through what would have been my alarm, my host family tries to get me out of bed, they don't know about this whole event so I break down and spill the Cheetos. I end up sleeping a full 12 hours that day, and then another 4 hour nap in the afternoon. My host mother buys me an alarm clock so that I can leave my phone off at night. Because I missed an exam, I have to go in on Friday and do a makeup, pushing the family's vacation back by one day. I am pissed. This continues for 3 days. I think it's because he never actually had a real live milady to text, so he's gonna take this opportunity and run. Like a Tumblr user with a new gender identity. <laughs> Suddenly those years of beard, straight white boy, and beat us all come pouring out in a slurry of carbonated cheesy meat sauce. Oh god. It's a horrifyingly beautiful slow motion train wreck, which is why it took me so long to tear myself away. I finally block Sam's number Wednesday afternoon. He figures this out, however, and starts texting me from a different number. At first, he's apologetic probably realizing that he overdid things a wee bit and is trying to backpedal. Knighthood prevails soon enough. He starts to ask me about John. You guys spent a lot of time together. 
Yeah, we're pretty good friends. Oh, j just friends? Yes, Sam. So I see I'm not the only one to fall victim to the friend zone then. <laughs> I have no idea how to respond. <laughs> Who would? So I just wait. It never takes long. Indeed. Well, I really just think John only pays attention to you because of how much makeup you wear and the way that you dress. Really, if you want to find someone that can respect you and treat you like a lady, you can present yourself that way and the right guy will find you. Dress for the relationship I want, right? Okay, have any Urukai propositioned you, Sam? <laughs> Plus, John doesn't really dress like he has any class either. John wears bootylicious jeans and muscle tees like a normal hot person. Sam speaks from experience, naturally, having about as much class as a Marxist utopia. <laughs> Deep cuts, OP. I'm pretty done hearing about how gross I am for trying to make myself look good, so I silence my phone and finally get a full night's rest in. Sir Sam walks back his last tirade and a series of pitiful messages that I can't even bring myself to quote for the cringe pain. That Friday, I show up and make up my last exam. I should have known that I couldn't make it out of this week without an encounter, IRL, with the obese, but hold on to your nachos because that's the next story. Let's see what the next story holds. <laughs> Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to Christmas. <laughs> Christmas special. Or why I'm no longer surprised by anything. This will be the fifth installment of Chivalrous Sam. Trigger warning, pasta with extra cringe. Player one is me, Lady Saber, 16 years old, foreign exchange student. I've just finished most of my midterms, barely, with Sam's help. By help, I mean keeping me up at all hours of the night with creepy messages. Also, I'm looking forward to a week off for Christmas and experiencing the holiday American style. Player two is Sir Sam Smooth Cheeks, the pure and gentle knight. Smells like a vile mix of fermenting sweat and the spaghetti of Satan. <laughs> He's also fat. There's no way to sugarcoat it without that being eaten too. Where's a plaid trilby? Different one almost every time I see him. I still have no idea how many he actually has. Whitewashed jeans, rage faces t-shirts under a nondescript black hoodie, carrying a snowbank of dandruff on each shoulder. Also, despite his girth, he has a squeal of a voice that is almost indistinguishable from a piglet. Player 3 is John, the guy I'm crushing on who's in a few of my classes. Wears jeans, t-shirt, American Eagle hoodie, and a leather belt with an oversized shiny buckle. He and Sam have had a few minor run-ins, and they don't like each other one bit. Watching them face off is usually cartoonish. John also speaks passable French. This story begins Friday morning, the last day of exam week before Christmas break. It's exam makeup day, so a lot of people aren't there, but after the two hour morning exam session, the rest of the day is just Christmas parties and secret Santa. John is my secret Santa in English class by look of the draw. It's mostly just inside joke stuff. I think a do rag and a bottle of Elmo shampoo was included, including a little thing of eyeshadow and blush, just for Sam. <laughs> Interestingly, though, the colors actually match me. I don't know how long he must have spent trying to pick them out, but it's really sweet. Around lunchtime, I get a new text from Sam. Got a present for you? <laughs> Let me know what I can give it. Oh boy, I can't wait. What is it, Sam? I can't tell you. <laughs> It'd spoil the surprise. I'm pretty sure the surprise will spoil the surprise, too. I can't give it to you at school, though. Maybe after. So you're giving me something that you aren't allowed to carry on school grounds. Great. If you aren't allowed to have it at school, I don't think it's something I want, Sam. No, trust me. You like it. Let me guess. It's also ten inches. We go around and around like this for a little while before I give up and ignore his subsequent teaser messages like, I bet you can't wait to have it in your hands. And my personal favorite, It's long and stiff, winky face. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Just as subtle as a sledgehammer. <laughs> My mind is spinning for the rest of the day, running through lists of the possible gift. Is it a sex toy? A five-gallon drum of meat sauce? Maybe a blade of valerian steel? All are equally plausible. Fast forward to the end of the day, I'm filing to the bus loop with the rest of the school, when I'm intercepted by Sam, like an offensive pass from Tony Romo. Hey, Lady Saber, Merry Christmas. <laughs> you look enchanting today. 
Thanks, Sam. You too. Don't. I meant Merry Christmas to you too. That's what I get for not thinking. He's carrying a long tube in one hand, wrapped haphazardly in Christmas paper, like from Santa's homeless cousin. <laughs> a blue bow is dangling from the side. It makes a fedorable picture. In the other hand, a foot-long hot dog is at the mercy of the black hole which functions as his mouth. Mustard, ketchup, and chili dribble while the meat stick vanishes at an alarming pace. I got you a present, Lady Saber. Hot dog goes in, chunks come out. You can't explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Are you going to tell me what it is? I can't do that. <laughs> it's a present. He's squeaking with delight. I assume he makes the same noise when Mom brings home a can of SpaghettiOs. <laughs> Sam, if I'm not supposed to have it at school, I really don't want to open it here. We're at the bus loop now. I'm anxious to find my bus and just bug out. Sam presses on, uninhibited, thrusting the package into my arm like it's a squealing baby. Ironic, given the circumstances. For my lady. It's some kind of hollow tube. Definitely something long and stiff bumps around inside when I give it a rattle. Sam looks like he's about to jump out of his skin. This is embarrassing. People are looking. Sam is in his own little world with my lady. I'm not tearing the paper off, so I just poke a hole in the end. I can't see inside. It's dark. I'm scared. <laughs> I imagine the scene from Indiana Jones where all the faces melt off. And I feel like I might be facing a similar fate. I grip my teeth and reach in. My fingers find metal, and then something soft like leather. The shape is very familiar. I grasp and pull. No way. I draw out the bell guard and the first six inches of a saber. On the pommel is the brand for Leon Paul, which is Cadillac level fencing gear, especially custom made weapons. This one feels exceptionally light. I am totally floored. The amount of research to figure out exactly what was good in a weapon you don't fence with must have taken an enormous amount of time, and one of their weapons can easily cost over a hundred British pounds. I can actually give him a genuine smile. Thank you, Sam. This is fabulous. It's clear that he wants to stay and talk, but I have to find my bus. I double dodge his attempt at a hug and narrowly escape with a fist bump. If only it was that easy. My bus has changed today. And I miss the announcement at the end of class. I walk up and down the loop, looking for the bus number and failing to find it. They start pulling away, one by one, and I realize too late that there had been a change. I try to give my host brother a call, but he doesn't pick up. Eventually, I'm stranded at the loop with a few stragglers. Sam has wandered off, like a lion that missed the first rush at his prey. I know that John carpools with his dad, so I message him, asking if my dumbass can get a ride home. I head up to the parking lot where the parents are pulling through and meet up with him. What's in the tube? John asks. It's Sam's present. He pulled out all the stops on a new saber. I draw out a little bit of it to show it to him. Damn, really? It must have been expensive. We have a lot of time to sit around before John's dad shows up, so we perch ourselves on the brick wall next to the sidewalk. I'm pretty sure I wear my do-rag for a portion of this time. Yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> Peace out. Soon enough. Sam approaches like a tornado in a trailer park, hailing me with that full arm wave. John and I are sitting, so Sam takes a moment to revel in his ability to tower over us. He's still eating. This time it's a Tupperware container full of ravioli. Jesus, does it end? <laughs> Apparently not. Hey Lady Saber, why are you up here? I, I thought you rode the bus. I missed my bus. It changed. Oh, that sucks. Hey, I know. I could give you a ride home. My mom will be here any second. That's okay, Sam. John's giving me a ride. Sam gives John a sidelong glance that lasts a little too long. I could tell John had his jimmies rustled, so I defuse the situation by asking John to find out where his dad is, which keeps him busy for long enough to cool down. My mom will be here soon, Lady Saber. We got space in our car. It's no big deal. That's okay, Sam. I'm riding with John. Lady Saber... I don't have to offer you a ride. <laughs> I bet John is just doing it to get some alone time with you. Yeah, because having your parents on the front seat makes for a perfect makeout environment. He says this like it's a joke, but he's the only one forcing laughter. John has had enough and rises to his full height, looking down his nose at Sam. She told you no, twice. Back off, Sam. They both inflate like pufferfish, and I might have laughed if I wasn't so afraid of them tearing into each other. 
Thankfully, this only lasts for a very tense 30 seconds before Sam's ride pulls up. He makes no move to leave until his mom rolls down the window and starts hollering, Sam! Sam! <laughs> he turns his agitation onto his mom. What? What do you mean, what? Just get in the car, Sam! I'm busy, mom! What on earth with? Sam, we have to go! Lady Saber won't come with. She needs a ride home. Well, it's not going to be with you, apparently. <laughs> Sam deflates like he's had a gastric bypass. A bunch of other people in the carpool line are staring. He shoulders his book bag and carries his still open pasta bowl into the back seat of his mom's car. <laughs> Mrs. Sam gives me a look before pulling away. Naturally, Sam manages to screw this up further. As soon as I'm in the car with John, Sam starts texting me. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you like your present. I told you you would. <laughs> what did John get you? Uh, all aboard the cringe train. <laughs> it was my secret Santa in English. He just got me some funny stuff that we like to joke about. Oh, okay, but not like a real gift or anything? I decided to have a little fun. John is sitting next to me, so he's reading too, and he eggs me on. He got me some makeup, and like a drunken streaker at a football game, Sam's off. Seriously? He got you makeup? That's like the worst thing you could ever get a girl. Like he's just telling you, you're not pretty enough for me, so put this on. Why do you even put up with someone who clearly has no respect for you? It's really sad that girls get taken in by guys who don't deserve them at all. Choo-choo! <laughs> this continues for what might have constituted a five-paragraph essay on why I'm the bitchiest bitch that ever bitched. Gaining speed and losing altitude with each subsequent message. John and I are killing ourselves laughing. Finally, Sam finishes, and there's a pause like he's not quite sure what to do. I don't reply until he follows up with, Anyway, what's up? <laughs> Cringe lord. This makes me lose it. Sam, I'm going to involve myself with other people. You might not like some of them. But who I associate with is not any of your business. If you can't deal with that, then you don't need to talk to me anymore. He doesn't reply for a while. I'm back at home when he responds with, Fine, but if you're going to be that way, I want that saber back. Keeping it classy like a true gentleman. Milady is unmoved. Sir Sam keeps his distance over the Christmas break, instead opting to post ambiguously about me on Facebook. The first post is something along the lines of, Breakups are hard. <laughs> I wish I was kidding. The Facebook collection will follow this story, but it'll take me a while to collect the screen caps. I promise, though, it is worth the wait. God, dude, that's such like a trash move. Like, oh, okay, you're not gonna let me tell you exactly who to hang out with? Then give me my present back. If I knew the present came with strings attached, I wouldn't have accepted it in the first place. Of course, I suppose that Lady Saber should have expected that it came with strings attached. <laughs> You don't get something that nice for free, especially not from a neckbeard. God, just such a horrible person. But I suppose we shall see just how much more horrible it can get. <laughs> Chivalrous Sam tries to Facebook, or how I learned what it's like to share the internet with a cyber bulimic. This will be the sixth installment of Sir Sam the Chivalrous, and spans most of Christmas break, including screenshots as well as interaction between Sam and I. Player one is me, Lady Saber, 16-year-old foreign exchange student from Belgium. Exam week is finally over, so I'm enjoying the holiday out of town with my host family. Also, I'm a huge A Song of Fire and Ice and Lord of the Rings nerd. Player 2 is Sir Sam the Chivalrous Smooth Cheeks, the whitest knight of them all. Generally a lard, with the ever-present aroma of stale Italian food. Never removes his trilby because he never sleeps and never showers. <laughs> Sam also has the Facebook habits of someone with an eating disorder. I have no other notion of how to describe it. He'll make four, five, six posts in rapid succession about anything, ranging from atheism, Look what a nice guy TM I am! and general rants designed to just flaunt his supposed intelligence. This is the binge. About an hour later, he'll come back and purge all of them, or four out of five, no matter how much time he spent on thesaurus.com writing them. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen, and it's why I'm not able to screen cap most of the stuff that he actually posts. Player 3 is John, guy I'm crushing on, all around good person. We aren't officially dating yet, but it's heading that way. Arch nemesis to Sam. 
he's not in this story, but he gets mentioned, so that's a bit of his backstory. Sam's posts and comments are in red. Random people are in blue. Pink is for my ladies. <laughs> <laughs> this story begins immediately after the previous one, the day before Christmas break. I check Facebook, mostly keeping up with friends and families overseas, and I see one of Sam's tirades clogging my feed like a cholesterol plaque. Breaking up with people you are dating is hard, guys. Honestly, breakups are the most arduous thing someone can experience. <laughs> Which fake girlfriend did you break up with now? Fuck you, Blue! I've never had a fake girlfriend. Or very likely any girlfriend for that matter. <laughs> also, that comment should give you an idea of Sam's dating history. Apparently in middle school, Sam made up a series of girlfriends in more and more outlandish tales. He'd find some girl on the internet, snag a few of her pictures, and flaunt them around. As soon as people would start poking holes in the story, he'd break up with her and start over again. Except each time the girl would get hotter and more amazing, and he'd round more of the bases with each of them. Eventually he claimed that he'd gotten laid by some out of his league blonde. Unbeknownst to Sam, that girl happened to live nearby, and was in high school just down the road from the middle school. Some people who knew her got in touch, confronted him with her in tow, and made a spectacle worthy of our slash public freakouts. <laughs> Continuing with our tour, if you look to your left, my ladies and gentlessers, we can see a homemade meme being circle jerked by Sam and a beardy friend. If you're looking for a fantastic guy to date, check your friends out first. <laughs> Why can't I find a nice guy exactly like you, except not you? I understand this fear, bro. Sometimes I think girls just want to be mistreated by some asshat. Exactly. I won't sacrifice who I am and treat a woman differently just because it's what they're accustomed to. If she doesn't care that you're nice, she's a bitch anyways, and you should just move on. Well, that is a top-tier meme if I've ever seen one. <laughs> check your friend zone reads to me in the same voice as check your privilege. I checked, it's still there. Also, I found the asshat in question. Sir Sam also makes a pass at my lady who appreciated his thought-provoking quote. The best love is the kind that awakens the soul, that makes us reach for more, that plants fire in our hearts and brings peace to our minds. I love this quote. I'm glad, my lady. Finally, someone of the opposite sex who can actually appreciate a meaningful conjecture. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <sighs> oh, the cringe pain is real. How did he ever think that would work? <laughs> All of these posts are from the same day. Those three are the only surviving companions of about 18 or so. You thought I was kidding? The next two days, radio silence. Blessed silence. <laughs> then in the afternoon, a text message. It's a screenshot of What Makes You Beautiful by One Direction. Not being weird, <laughs> just a song I like. I look it up, give it a listen. It's poppy and repetitive, so I turn it off after about 30 seconds. A few hours later, he follows up with What did you think? Not my taste. My taste is mostly screamo and classical orchestra, with a few select American alt-rock bands. Well, what is your taste? I forget sometimes that there is no font for sarcasm. Gospel. No response other than a string of Facebook posts, of which only two survive. If you go to church, you're literally Satan. If you participate in the organized destruction of independent thought called church, then we don't need to be acquainted. <laughs> Sounds like a good deal. If you don't go to church, your neckbeard smoosh. Take note, ladies. Reason is sexy. The atheist experience with three others. Godless bitches assemble. I'm not going to comment on any of these innocent women and get them caught in the crossfire, but you know what I'm thinking, don't you? <laughs> Come on. Everyone is a winner. <laughs> I debate telling him that it was just a joke, but I dread the outcome of that conversation and I don't have any idea how it would go. For the rest of the break, silence. Blessed silence. I have a blast with my host family, get more Christmas loot than I know what to do with, and generally just enjoy my break from school and Sir Sam. It's after New Year's Day when Sam gathers up enough alpha male energy to message me again. I keep up a strained conversation with him for about a half an hour while he talks about Call of Duty and stuff he got for Christmas. There are many times where I don't know how to respond, but he happily fills in the spaces and keeps on keeping on. Eventually he asks, What's wrong? Nothing, really. You're not saying much. 
Yeah, just not in the mood to talk right now. Oh, what'd I do? Sam, that's a pretty long list. I know. Sorry. I just haven't really had a girlfriend that I could talk to very much before, so I'm still figuring stuff out. I'm not your girlfriend, Sam. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, like a friend that's a girl. Okay, there was a space between girl and friend, so I give him the benefit of the doubt. Before I can clarify further the status of our relationship, he's off in another direction. So, do you speak French? Yeah. That's cool. Me too. Okay, that came out of nowhere like a clown in a shitty funhouse. I'm a bit skeptical, for obvious reasons, so I push the issue gently with him. The following messages were in French, and I've translated. You speak French? Yes. I didn't know that. Why didn't you tell me? I don't know. Okay, what are you doing now? I'm hungry. <laughs> the shocker of a lifetime. I'm being eaten. What? You're being eaten? Yes, I'm being eaten for lunch. <laughs> I give up here because it's pretty clear he's using some sort of translating software or an online dictionary. Rip in peace, my mother tongue. <laughs> a little explanation about the French language. In English, when you want to use a verb, you need a helping verb to go with it. I am playing, or he is eating. In French, you don't. I eat, I am eating, I do eat, are all the same phrase. You have the subject, and then the verb, and the helping verb is implied in the action. Some English speakers, however, will try to translate literally from English to French. So in this case, Sam translated, I am eating, directly. And the result, I am eaten. <laughs> At the very least, we can rest assured that this will be the most effective weight loss plan ever. <laughs> yeah, but who wants a Mountain Dew basted Cheeto encrusted slab of fat? Ugh. <laughs> Later that day, he follows with, <coughs> Lol, I don't really speak French. I was just messing with you. I don't give a reply. None of this, however, is the crown jewel, emboldened by what could only be a vat of homemade ravioli. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Sam takes aim. Hey, a bunch of friends and I are going to see The Hobbit the Saturday after break. Do you want to tag along? John has beat him to the punch, actually, but I'm not keen to give him that detail. No thanks, Sam. Ah, uh, why not? I don't give a reply. Soon enough, though, he follows up with, Bet you're going with John, huh? Am I really that transparent? <sighs> well, there's no point in lying to him. Yes, I am. Okay, I get it. I don't think I'll ever be able to convince you that he's bad news. But I promise someday, you'll see what I mean. This isn't exactly a tough bet. Either we break up or never become an official couple at some point. Anytime in the future and you win. Otherwise, we get married and live happily ever after, because that's a realistic option. Another cheesy meat gorge of academic papers ensues on Facebook, followed by book-burning levels of purge, and this gem, the only survivor. I finally deciphered the age-old confusion. Why do girls only go for jerks and leave guys who will cherish them in the dust? Well, ladies, mostly, and also gentlemen, the justification is in our upbringing. You see... When girls are little, and a boy precurses them, or calls them a malicious name, parents inform girls that he just likes you, honey. In turn, when girls grow up and begin looking for a mate, the only thing they associate with affection is maliciousness. It's a representative model of Pavlov's dogs. Thus, when a man comes along who has class and dignity, and treats women the way they should be treated, they've not been conditioned to interpret this as endearment or they ignore his advances. In short, nice guys finish last not because we are inferior, but because society as a whole endeavors in the opposite tendency. <laughs> no likes, no comments, as it should be. If you make it out of that alphabet soup with all of your brain cells, I commend you. <laughs> I probably did lose a few. At the time, I didn't really understand why he and people like him all had the same pattern of thesaurusing every fifth word in their online post. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I have an inkling. Most neckbeards fancy themselves as being on a higher intellectual plane than everyone else. Yes, most of them are slightly above average intelligence, but nowhere near the genius scale, and most are all chronic underachievers. 
Despite this, they've built an image in their heads of being the brainiest guy in their zip code, so they talk the way that they believe an actual smart person would talk. In the spirit of Facebook, I'll end it with a made-up quote. A smart man can play dumb, but a dumb man in no way can play smart. This may be the last post that I write about Sir Sam for a while. I've acquired a small following of trolls, so I'm taking a break until they get bored. I also have real life stuff to take care of. I don't want to saturate either neckbeard stories or fat people stories with tales of Sir Sam. So there will be more stick and less carrot, at least for now. Well, I feel that, Lady Saber. I got to do some stuff today, too, but I spent a good couple hours recording. I'm definitely hoping that this video is beefy enough to sate some people. Even if they've heard the story before, I maybe put my own spin on it and stuff like that. Obviously, Sir Sam is quite a character, <laughs> and it's no wonder that he developed his own little following, especially with the way that it's written. It's, it's just impeccable. I find myself giggling the entire time. I can't wait to get into part two. Chase Sir Sam the Chivalrous Tries to Sword Part 2, or How a Beatus Beard Literally Scarred Me for Life. This will be the seventh installment of Chase Sir Sam the Chivalrous, and the long-awaited sequel to the first Sir Sam Tries to Sword. Trigger warning, your jimmies will be rustled. Player 1 is me, Lady Saber, 16-year-old exchange student from Belgium, very avid fencer, been doing it for about 10 years. Couple this with my Lord of the Rings and a Song of Fire and Ice nerding, and I am Neckbeard Smoosh. Players 2 and 3 are my fencing coaches, Mr. and Mrs. Coach, who are a husband and wife couple. Really fabulous people, super dedicated to their sport. Mr. Coach is a large Eastern European mammoth man, <laughs> who sounds like a thunderstorm. He looks really intimidating, but he's actually just a big teddy bear in disguise. Mrs. Coach is almost as small as I am, but can still roar like a lion. She tolerates no BS and is intent on making everyone perform better. Player 4 is smooth-cheeked Sir Sam the Chaste and Chivalrous, the whitest knight of them all. Fat, sweaty with a high-pitched voice, he has the personality of a nervous Pomeranian, except with more nervous quivering and nervous hate. <laughs> he wears New Balance sneakers, plus 10 speed and 5 health, cargo shorts, plus 20 carry, Cool story, babe. Now make me a sandwich t-shirt and navy blue trilby with feather in the band combined for plus 35 negging. <laughs> he also smells like he bathed in Axe chocolate spray cologne, but still that was unable to mask the scent of rancid meat sauce. <laughs> God, every time we say that, it's horrible. A small note about the setting. A short wall on the end of our gym functions as a rack for practice weapons. It's somewhat for show, but the weapons are all fully functional, so people who rent gear can use one. If you haven't read the first Sir Sam Tries to Sword, go do that. Seriously guys, stuff I talk about here will make a lot more sense. This story takes place the week after Christmas break, on Wednesday afternoon. School is back in session, as is fencing practice. I've received a very nice fencing glove from my host family, so I'm intent on practicing with it. I have the same setup going on with my looks as I described in the previous story. No makeup, hair tightly wrapped and out of the way, workout clothes for minus 10 to my attractiveness stat. Funny thing, Sam hasn't once told me that I look naturally beautiful this way, like he's always tirelessly plugging. I arrive an hour before practice, earlier than usual. Instead of running in the freezing cold rain, I'm in the gym putting Mrs. Coach to shame on a leg machine. We take turns one-upping each other until it's getting close to practice time. Mr. and Mrs. Coach go to set up, and I cool down with a short walk indoors and a drink of water. Sir Sam doesn't show up for warm-ups. Wednesday is the one day a week he's signed up for practice, but I'm not surprised if he's avoiding me, or has just realized that copycatting my interests won't score him any points. I'm not complaining. I get into my zone and have a lot of fun. Instead of conditioning warm-ups, we play dodgeball, and I'm about as unstoppable as a smitten neckbeard's affections. <laughs> We're suiting up for drills when Sir Sam finally arrives, about as welcome as the fire marshal at a dorm party. His hair is so greasy that the rain just beads up on top of it. <laughs> about half of our class are girls, so they're eyeing him with some venom. Sir Sam is oblivious, but senses a bit of awkwardness in the air, so he tries to break the tension with some light humor. Here I am. <laughs> I just showed up for the fun part. I swear his voice is indistinguishable from Kyle's cousin. I'm big. The coaches hate it when people do this. 
It's impossible to actually improve your form when all you want to do is show up for the last 45 minutes and swing a blade around. They won't get on your case for this, of course, because you paid for the full session. And if you continue to suck, then you keep coming back for more. <laughs> Flawless plan. Mrs. Coach doesn't want to get near Sam, so Mr. Coach takes him to get the rental gear. Mrs. Coach is explaining the drill to us when they both return. The Sabre group is an odd number again, so I sit the first round out, dressed in my uniform with my mask off. Mrs. Coach asks Sam why he skipped out on the warm-ups today, and Sam goes full conditions. Well, last time the warm-ups made me really tired, and so I couldn't free fence hardly at all. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. If you keep doing them, eventually you won't be so tired and... But if I'm exhausted, I can't practice the actual fencing, though. It's annoying, because I want to be better at sword fighting, not just doing lunges and footwork. Lunges and footwork are only 80% of fencing anyways. Who needs it? Okay, Sam, let's just get you warmed up before you do drills. Give me two sets of advances and retreat. What? I'm already in my uniform, though. Good. It'll help you warm up faster. Mrs. Coach has a negative zero patience for lazy people. I can tell she's straining. But uh, I had asthma as a kid. If I get too hot, I could have trouble breathing, and I haven't had an inhaler for breathing treatment in forever, so I don't think it's safe. Sam. A few sets of footwork won't kill you. I've got to teach the drills, so let's go, okay? Shit lady game on point, as usual, Mrs. Coach. Sam's a little miffed that Mrs. Coach has no concern for his well-being. I'm the one paying you, so technically I should be the one in charge. And I came here to fence, not do some stupid drill. Mrs. Coach is two inches from snapping, so she gives it up. <sighs> You're right, Sam. Grab a practice foil and jump in with your group. She turns on her heel and goes to instruct the epaists. Sam is smirking like he just won a free pizza for outwitting a fundamentalist Christian. He swaggers to the wall of practice weapons and is drawn to the sabers. I'm standing directly behind him and to his right, watching him out of the corner of my eye. He wraps his sausage fingers around the handle and draws it out of the rack. He's holding it in a two-handed death grip, nowhere near how you're actually supposed to hold a saber. I can see his imagination just whirring away. <laughs> the hamster's running on the wheel. Sir Sam is a Japanese samurai warrior in the midst of an epic battle. He takes a small down cut to split his midget opponent in half. Damn, no one saw that. It was totally epic. His next challenger is cut in half through the middle by a slow motion side stroke. There's an enemy behind him, so he spins with the force of a great typhoon to decapitate his foe with one fell stroke. Unfortunately, he doesn't see Milady in the line of fire. It happens fast. I can see the blade coming towards me, getting bigger and bigger. I try to turn away, lean under the cut, but the weapon connects with the side of my face. There are two things that I remember most about the impact. One is the sickening crunch. And the second is the blade dragging through my skin, scraping against the bone as Sam pulls away. To call a saber or any fencing weapon blunt as a butter knife would be overstating the sharpness. It's really nothing more than a rounded piece of iron with a flattened tip. However, if you take two pieces of iron and bang them together a few thousand times, they will get some ragged edges, not to mention hundreds of tiny magnetized shavings clinging on for dear life. My memory's a little bit fuzzy after the hit. Everything runs together in a slurry of Mountain Dew and meat sauce. I got to ride in an ambulance. That was fun. I remember laughing because the sirens sounded weird. It's clear again when I wake up in a hospital bed. There's gauze over both eyes with little pinpricks in the center to see out of. The TV sucks, even if I could see the whole screen. Like some sick little joke, My Little Pony is the only show that comes in 100% clear. The rest is shitty reality TV, local news, and soap opera reruns. I'd opt for the soap opera reruns. <laughs> All told, it's an impressive list of injuries. I took a fracture to the zygomatic bone, which is on the outside of the eye socket. I had a grade 3 lateral concussion. My brain went ping pong from side to side. The laceration caused by the saber needed stitches. The weapon itself scratched my cornea and left more than a dozen fragments behind in my skin and a few in my eye. Some came out with a magnet. The others had to be picked out. They put me under for this, as a number of those fragments were trapped under my eyelids. 
Jesus Christ. I spent the night in the hospital after getting hit. Once it was clear I didn't have any permanent brain damage or swelling, I went home the next morning. I was on some wicked strong painkillers for the next few days. Sweet. <laughs> my face from my cheek to my temple swelled up and throbbed for the rest of the week. Not sweet. <laughs> I avoided mirrors for a long time. Sir Sam sent me flowers and a card. I didn't read the card, but I wish that I had. I'm sure it would have been great material. Additionally, even though what he did was an accident, Mr. and Mrs. Coach knew that I could have easily sued the pants off them, and they disallowed Sam from fencing at their club anymore. Sam, or at least Sam's mom, had to pay to replace my fencing jacket, underarm protector, and lame, about $500 worth of gear. The cut scarred. It started out as thick as my thumb, bright pink, and ran from the corner of my eye to the middle of my temple. It's receded a lot since then and faded to a pale white, but it's not going away any further. I spent a long time being ridiculously self-conscious about it. Now I think it looks fucking badass, <laughs> but, but it's taken me a while to get there. I know this story was more feels than funny, but squeezing humor into this one felt like I was forcing cheese whiz back into the tube, so I cut the awkward, cringy stuff out. I know I said I wouldn't post for a while, and here I am, but I'm a dirty slut for upvotes. <laughs> I'm going to do important real life things now and stop obsessively checking Reddit. I mean it this time, for seriously. If I have my chronology straight, Sir Sam Tries Feminism should be next. So I mean, okay, I guess it was an accident what happened, but I still have a lot of questions. Who paid for the medical bills? Is this covered by the Belgian government or did your host family have to step up? Because the American healthcare system is just a mess, so even if you had to go in and have stitches, some anesthesia to put you under and pull some metal shavings out from under your eyelids. You're looking at thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars, which is just insane. I understand why you wouldn't want to sue like Mr. and Mrs. Coach, because they're cool, it's not really their fault, but I probably would take it to Sir Sam one way or the other. I understand it was an accident, but somebody's got to cover these medical bills, dude. How about uh, mental trauma? <laughs> and it seems like according to OP, there was actually some mental trauma, you know? You got a scar on this face that you got to deal with for the rest of your life. And honestly, most of the time, scars look pretty cool, uh, even on chicks. <laughs> I remember when I was like 13 or 14, I would wear an eye patch consistently. And people would be like, how'd you lose your eye? And I'd make up some elaborate story. God, I was, I was so close to being a neckbeard myself. I think that's why I'm so interested in neckbeard stories. <laughs> oh... I'm glad I got past my eye patch phase, whether it was needed or not. And I'm glad you got past your eye patch phase, even though it was definitely needed. Sir Sam is definitely like just a hapless moron, you know? But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't sue the pants off of him regardless. <laughs> I know I would have done. But let us see how the story progresses in the next episode, right now. Chased Sir Sam the Chivalrous Tries to Feminism. <laughs> God. Or, why telling women that you want to empower them doesn't make for a good negging setup. Hi everyone, it's Lady Saber, back with the 8th installment of Sir Sam. This story takes place the week after Sir Sam put me in the ER. Player 1 is me, Lady Saber, 16 year old foreign exchange student from Belgium. At the time, I'm on some pretty intense painkillers, so I'm as high as a kite. Thankfully, I'm a happy, albeit emotional drunk. The swelling in my face has gone down considerably, and the color has faded from dark purple to yellows and greens. The cut itself is a very visible and angry red, with the stitches still intact. I've laid it on thick with the foundation and concealer as much as possible, some crazy eyeliner and shadow colors to draw away attention, as well as wearing my hair forward instead of back. As a note, I'm really into strategy games, chess and go being my favorite. Player 2 is Sir Sam the chaste and chivalrous, the whitest knight in all the land. Inconsiderate meat planet with no tolerance for rejection. He wears New Balance sneakers, mid-calf socks, baggy light wash jeans, and a stained This is what the feminist looks like t-shirt under a puffy bubble coat. Thanks, mom! Instead of spaghetti sauce, Sam reeks of Axe chocolate spray cologne. I can't imagine anything else than him seeing this commercial and thinking that that's how it works in real life. He still doesn't shower, but Axe Spray is a fine substitute, right? Oh, I forgot the Trilby. How could I almost forget the Trilby? It's atrocious, as usual. 
playing gray felt with a black band. Player three is John, the guy I'm crushing on who shares my English class, is outdoorsy, athletic, takes no BS, and is actually above average intelligence, great at coming up with creative insults. He and Sam are arch nemesis, wears bootylicious jeans, leather belt with a shiny buckle, a Venture Crew t-shirt, and an American Eagle hoodie. John and I have a way of speaking to each other, which sounds horrifying to anyone else. We call each other nasty names as a form of endearment. What's up, bitch? Not too much, you damn slut. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone else talked to me this way, I would probably lose it with them, but for John and I, it's a thing. I don't think that I could stand that, but you do you, boo-boo. <laughs> Player four is my English teacher, Mr. Teacher. Pretty minor character. He's a tall guy, has a lot of fun with his job, usually wears a shirt and tie with some nice pants. He honestly thinks most of the students in his classes are idiots, and he's right. But you'd never know it for his lighthearted demeanor. John and I had gotten pretty sick of chess club's neckbeardy atmosphere, so we decided to found our own Go Club. Mr. Teacher, as it happened, was a pretty big fan of Go as well, and he agreed to be the sponsor and host the club a few times a week. To drum up some interest, we made some signs and posted them around the school, as well as making announcements in classes. I did not know this until that Monday, but one of the teachers who taught at the standard level had walked out of her job in the middle of the week, sick of the school system. The affected English classes were being spread around to other English teachers until a replacement could be found. Guess which goober ended up in my class? Lunchtime rolls around on Monday, the opening day for Go Club. It's a fun time. About a dozen people show up. Only Mr. Teacher has an actual Go set with boards and stones. For the rest, we have printed paper boards with black and white M&Ms for pieces. Black and white M&Ms? Bruh, where'd you get them? <laughs> There's a bunch of sheets with the rules and Mr. Teacher and I are helping people to learn. John pairs off to play with somebody else, and I wait for Mr. Teacher to do something on the computer before we start a game. Right on cue, guess who? Sir Sam swaggers in like a drunk circus monkey. He doesn't see me at first, being on the other side of the room. He says, hello, to Mr. Teacher. I hunker down to avoid being spotted, but lo and behold, Sir Oinkles sniffs me out like a truffle. <laughs> He bumbles his way across the room, bonking tables and rubbing against people on the way. He's carrying a half-empty two-liter bottle of Diet Dr. Pepper. Before I know it, he's hovering over me like a black hawk in Somalia. I told y'all Dr. Pepper's the second choice for neckbeards, after the do. <laughs> I'm greeted with a tip of the trilby. Hey, Lady Saber. Glad to see you're back. <laughs> I saw the announcement for this club and... <laughs> Figured that no one but you could be behind it. Wanna play a game? By the way, you look a lot better today. And the backhandiest compliment ever award goes to... Sam plops down into the chair in front of me, and it squeals in agony. <laughs> I should have left right then. Maybe told Sam that I was waiting for someone. I would have, if I hadn't been so damn stoned. My brain wasn't looking for a way out of the situation. It was just saying... All right, girl, let's put on our seatbelts and do this thing. <laughs> Thanks, brain. Sam gives me an oblivious smile. He makes a pretty big show of removing his jacket to showcase his feminism shirt in all its glory. For Darwin's sake, there's a light-colored stain on the hem. <laughs> he opens his lunchbox and sets up a buffet. Chicken salad, tuna salad, finger chips, and goddamn shit-filled ravioli again. The eruption of smell is on the nuclear level. People ask, what is that? And Sam proudly obliges his fully loaded spork. He starts shoveling it into his mouth like a freshly dug grave. <laughs> I'm about to play as black when he sets a piece down as white. Sam, black goes first. Nuh-uh, it's just like a chess. White goes first. I'm not in the mood to argue with someone so smart who clearly knows everything there is to know about the game, so I let him make up his own rules as we go along. He takes a swig from his bottle, backwashes half of it, and rips a belt that would put Robert Barathe on to shame. It turns most of the heads in the room, and Sam thinks that this is the funniest thing in the world. He giggles like a small child and scarfs a few M&Ms. <laughs> John can see that I'm in trouble and stands up to intervene. If something goes south on the first day, though, I doubt anyone will want to come again. John and Sam make eye contact, and I ward off John with a shake of my head. Sam smirks at John like he's the one who stared him down, 
and he turns back to me with one arm draped over the back of his seat and soda bottle in one hand. The most interesting man in the world. <laughs> he thinks he looks cool, but he just looks like an alcoholic. <laughs> you know, John isn't a feminist. Do you always begin conversations this way? I was recently introduced to the Princess Bride while on bed rest, so I shamelessly make references. <laughs> Not really, I guess. Well, I've been reading a lot about feminism lately, and how women should be empowered to make their own choices and shit, and John isn't the kind of guy who would be a feminist. He'll just, like, you know, fucking go up and put his arm around you without your consent. <laughs> I think that's pretty messed up. Oh, just like Sir Sam did in the first Sir Sam Tries the Sword story. Huh. <laughs> Sam sounds like an 11-year-old on Xbox Live, and it physically hurts to listen. He's onto the chips now, and barbecue-flavored dust is building up in dull orange snowdrifts. Crumbs are accumulating on his lips as well, like the crust on a creme brulee. Mmm, but not really. <laughs> now, I'm not the kind of person that wants to be asked every five seconds, Is this okay? May I hold your hand? I like it when someone can read my signals of approval or disapproval and handle the situation with confidence. I'm laughing at your joke? All right. I see you touching my elbow. I'll touch your elbow too. Yeah, I'm cool with your arm around my waist. Whoa, okay, that hand's getting a little low. Notice how I shrugged my hips? Yeah, there you go. Stay right there. This is how people actually communicate, not by narrating every physical action to each other and begging for approval or pardon. Just facts. His whole image is so comical and ridiculous, I can't help but giggle like an idiot. I don't want to, but I can't help myself. Inconceivable, I reply in my drug-addled, lilting voice. That's funny too, so I go into another fit of giggles. Sam takes my actions as genuine interests, not that I can really blame him, I guess. He powers through like it's his second plate of mashed potatoes, clearly impressed that I can analog with his extraordinary lexicons. I know, right? <laughs> I also really hate how the patriarchy forces women to uphold unrealistic beauty standards. Stupid stuff like makeup and heels. I think it would be great if everyone could just liberate themselves from double standards. I still don't get why you feel like you have to wear makeup so much. Honestly, you look just as good without it. For half of this time, his eyes are drifting up to the cut on my face. It's making me feel really self-conscious, so I turn my head to hide it almost to the extent that I'm looking directly away from him. I don't think things like blemishes or cuts and scars and stretch marks need to be covered up. Honestly, most of that stuff is pretty sexy. He wipes his hands on his shirt, leaving orange tiger stripes for plus five melee combat strength. <laughs> oh, you got me. That's a good one. This pushes me in the opposite direction of giggles. My throat catches, and I can feel tears welling up. I excuse myself, run to the bathroom, and spend about ten minutes crying. I do come back, but not to Sam's game. Instead, I slide a chair up next to John and get a much-needed hug. We stay this way for the rest of lunch, with Sam eyeing us disdainfully from across the room. When the bell rings, Sam makes a valiant approach to rescue Milady from the patriarchy. Hello, Lady Sable. Are you okay? If I hurt your feelings, I didn't... And John cuts in. Fuck off, Sam. I wasn't speaking to you, John. I was talking to... Lady Saber doesn't want to talk to you. Fuck off. I think the lady can speak for... Last chance, Sam. Sam puts his hands up in mocking defensiveness and backpedals. <laughs> okay, then. Just try to help. At least I'm not this guy, right? <laughs> he tips his hat and excuses himself with a... Good day, my lady. <laughs> he turns more into Gollum as this goes on. This is, of course, not the end. Overnight, I manage to develop a shiner as some of the blood from the side of my face pools near my eye. Makeup saves the day, but it's not totally hidden. After school, Sam is hovering nearby like there's a ribbon cutting at a new McBeatus while John and I talk near the bus loop. John, in our usual fashion, tells me that I'm a fabulous bitch muffin and my great white whale, I mean champion is close at hand to defend my lady's honor. John, what did you just call Lady Saber? John gives him a quizzical look. I turn to Sam. It's fine. He didn't mean it like, Holy shit, Lady Saber. Is that a black eye? Entirely too loud. 
People all around are now looking at us like we're from the zoo. Jesus Christ, John! Did you fucking hit her? No, John replies. My French instincts kick in as I retreat to his side. <laughs> oh. oh, sir, deny all you want, but we can all see that bruise. Sam, Lady Saber has a bruise because you hit her in the face with a piece of metal, you heroically stupid cunt. He doesn't have much of an answer for that, so he derails the train wreck even further. Why do you use the word cunt like it's an insult? You know, female body parts aren't inferior, John. And I'm sure others would agree that sexist language isn't very becoming. Not that someone who isn't a gentleman would understand. Okay, how about I call you a dick then? <laughs> Whatever you say, delusional shit rocket. John gives Sam a sweeping bow before turning his back and boxing him out. Sam skulks off. Why can't my lady just appreciate his concern for my lady's well-being? <laughs> he texts me later. Hey, I understand how hard it is to be in an abusive relationship like that, but I'm here if you need someone to talk to. I'm not in an abusive relationship. Okay, if you say so, but the offer still stands, lol. Sam, you need to stop forcing yourself between me and John. That evening, John and I make ourselves... Facebook official! Da, 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 da. That's the most official kind of official. <laughs> There's no reply from the buttery front except for a cascade of Facebook posts. He thought he deleted all of them, but by some miracle, trigger warning, OP gets wrecked, this one survives. If you need any more validification... <laughs> God, it's a mess already. That women don't tend towards nice guys... Just look at the sheer number who stay in obliquious relationships with guys who strike, maltreat, and castigate them. Why would you willingly endure such erroneousness unless some satisfaction was ultimately derived? Seriously? Number one, you talk like you're fucking Shakespeare or some shit. <laughs> Calm down. You ain't. Second, are you seriously blaming girls who get beat up by their boyfriends for getting beat? How retarded do you gotta be? As someone who was in an abusive relationship for two years, fuck you sideways with a glass bottle. No one wants to be in that situation. The only reason you stay is because you're afraid that they'll kill you if you leave, and that asshats like you will blame you for the abuse. Also, yeah, you're not as smart as you think you are. Okay, damn, chill. <laughs> All I'm saying is that some girls go for assholes. Yeah, it's sad that some girls get beat up, but honestly, if you just give nice guys a chance... It wouldn't happen. <laughs> Serious question. Were you thrown against the wall as a kid? <laughs> it's not like some guy is going to tell you, oh, hey, by the way, I like to beat up on my girlfriend. Girls out there every day get beat up, raped, drugged, fucking killed by crazy boyfriends. And all you got to say is, if you don't touch my dick, then you deserve it. No wonder everyone thinks you're a fucking tool. Damn. You just love to see people get blasted on their own Facebook posts. <laughs> OP did get wrecked so hard. That's that's glorious. I'm super glad we cut that in. <laughs> John and I cut school the next morning to go see The Hobbit. You need a break from that fat dick fart. <laughs> so eloquent. We go to lunch and spend the afternoon shopping. I, like most European exchange students, went nuts buying cheap clothes in American department stores. Sam, of course, does not miss an opportunity to text me that John is clearly a bad influence on my education. Thanks, Dad. The following day at school, I'm looking fierce in a leather biker jacket, white tank underneath, dark wash jeans, and boot heels. In English, we're working in the computer lab, and Sam gets assigned a seat near me. He's still snacking and chugging a huge bottle of Coke, despite the no eating or drinking rule. The poor sap in between us can't stop Sam from crawling over him. <laughs> Leaning over his keyboard and getting in the way to blather on about how It's so great that I'm destroying the gender binary by wearing androgynous clothing. Eventually, the guy between us gets tired of cringing. Dude, shut up. Sam retreats into his place but doesn't stop talking or stuffing his face for a single second. He goes full fat logic towards the end of this rant telling me around multiple mouthfuls and in way too much detail why fat girls are prettier than skinny girls. 99% of people's body types are totally genetic no matter what. I mean, we're all fat when we're born anyways. 
<laughs> that may be true, but I don't think I've ever met someone who was born a Gorillasaurus. Like, I bet you'd be a lot better off if you just ate more. He finishes with a satisfied chuckle and a fistful of cheese puffs. <laughs> I eat more than 3,000 calories a day to maintain my workout schedule, and that's mostly vegetables and real food full of stuff that your body actually wants. Not neon orange and green packaged garbage full of sodium hexamabetus and methyl ethyl nasty shit. <laughs> if people's body types are genetic, then why is hating on skinny girls okay? Shit malating intensifies. I'm not hating, I mean, plus, you can always just eat more. Yeah, and you can always just exercise more too. Plus 500 XP, shit malady, level up. <laughs> Gosh, Lady Saber. I had no idea you were so body negative. Some people have medical conditions like asthma and heart disease, so they can't exercise no matter what. Plus, your body type is determined at birth, so you can't change it. I have asthma, so are you blaming me for my genes? No one, asthma or otherwise, should be able to breathe with that much food clogging their face hole. <laughs> I defuse the cringe bomb, though, and let him off with... Yeah, you're right. He turns away with a satisfied smirk, having clearly bested Milady in a duel of wits. To this day, I do not know from where this feminism charade sprouted forth. I'm assuming he saw something like this image, but I still don't know. This guy was watching the VMAs with me and now he's educating himself. How precious is that? He keeps asking me all these questions about aspects of feminism and he's like, so basically it's about letting women do what they want without being judged for it? And I was like, yeah, and he was like, oh, okay, that's so simple. Why isn't everyone a feminist? It's precious. Update, I banged him. <laughs> Regardless, he definitely thought that it would be a great ploy to get him laid. Unfortunately, he forgot you also have to have a personality. I would detail more as interactions like this go on for the next two weeks, but we've already got ourselves a supersized with extra fries story as it is. I'd hoped to publish this story last night, or maybe this morning, but anything I write after 11.30pm is basically shit, so I spent most of today fixing what I messed up. Merry Christmas, my lords and my ladies, and may you have a most euphoric new year. Oh, isn't that so fitting for this time of year? Hooray! I'm trying to keep our timelines equal, if you couldn't tell, so we can hit hyperdrive. <laughs> And then we can warp into the neckbeard dimension. And then we'll have endless stories and endless content. And it will be a wonderful time for all. Unless you're a milady. <laughs> this story is so fitting because a lot of guys that come out and tout their pro-feminism actually end up to be like the biggest predators of all. It's basically like a wolf in sheep's clothing type of situation. And unfortunately, sometimes it works. But on the other hand, a bit more fortunately... Uh, Sir Sam is nowhere near smart enough to make it work. I much prefer the term egalitarian, you know, I think that uh, everybody should have equal rights. But I mean, it is a touchy subject, especially in 2020 or 2021 as it is. <laughs> so I try not to touch it with a 10 foot pole. People ask me that question. I'm like, OK, what's your angle? <laughs> Why do you care? Sometimes you can just enjoy somebody's company and you don't got to get it all mucky mucked with politics and such. Sir Sam, of course, the scumbag as usual. Nothing has really changed except now he goes on diatribes about how women need to be empowered. Whoopie do. <laughs> Were you trying to empower Lady Saber by hitting her in the face with a sword? Very empowering. <laughs> I also think Lady Saber had a pretty good point about that body positivity movement. She's like, okay, then why is hating on skinny girls okay? Hmm, there's something to take home and chew on. Think about, you know, if you go on social media and you see a hot girl in a swimsuit, people are like, oh, she's a bitch. She's shallow, blah, blah, blah. If you see a fat girl in a, in a swimsuit, people are like, oh, beautiful. How brave. <laughs> people are so fake, man. Oh, there's been so much cringe already, but I think I'm ready for another story. What do you say, guys? Let's hop into it. I mean, guys and girls. I don't want to be a, a sexist or anything. <laughs> Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to atheism, or why debating in real life is harder without a thesaurus. <laughs> I thought he was an atheist already. I guess maybe I assumed that. Anyways, hi everyone, it's Lady Saber, back with the ninth installment of Sir Sam. 
The story takes place after the previous, but somewhat in tandem with Sir Sam's feminism streak. <laughs> That's killer. Sorry it's taken me a while to write this story. I had to nail down a few projects in real life. I also encountered a PC game called This War of Mine, which is fucking fantastic, and you should definitely play it. Even five years later, it's still fucking fantastic. You should definitely play it. <laughs> As a note to new readers, we're far enough along in this series where re-explaining all the background and settings would probably be pretty boring to the regulars. If you haven't read the other stories, go find MiladyBot in the comments and slurp up that euphoric, carbonated goodness. Player one is me, Lady Saber, still recovering from my face-bashing incident, but doing much better. The coloration is normalized significantly, and I'm slowly coming off the painkillers. The cut itself is closing enough that I don't have to bandage it regularly, although it's still very noticeable. Player 2 is Sir Samuel Smoothcheeks, the chaste and chivalrous knight. Enormous butter parade, socially impotent, with a terminal diagnosis of nice guy TM syndrome. Wears New Balance, baggy jeans, wide brim brown fedora, and a corduroy jacket. 0 out of 10, would not tip. Smells like he bathes and brushes his teeth with spaghetti sauce. Thickly veiled with Axe Chocolate Body Spray. Also a militant atheist, sent to Earth by Dawkins himself to enlighten the world with his own intelligence. Ah, oh, we'll all be euphoric soon. <laughs> this story takes place at Go Club. There's about 15 people there today, all playing with black and white M&Ms. After helping some of the new members set up, I sit down to eat my lunch, well ensconced in the back corner of the room. Everyone's favorite cringe factory shows up late. The door to the room is locked, so he grabs the handle and throttles it like his firstborn child. <laughs> Jerking it back and forth while pressing his face against the tiny slit of glass, you'd think a horde of zombies were behind him. The fast kind too, from the World War Z movie. Those fuckers were scary. Mr. Teacher is visibly annoyed, and reluctantly gets up from his desk to open the door for Sir Sam. The human hippo saunters in and acknowledges Mr. Teacher with a tip of the hat before scanning the room. He spots me quickly and moves in my direction, much in the way that a derailed freight train might move towards a children's cancer clinic. <laughs> <laughs> Tables are bumped. Sorry. Boards and pieces shift. My bad. And sides brush like the Titanic brushed the iceberg. Who's the boat and who's the iceberg is somewhat unclear in this situation. At long last, he reaches me and finds that there's no chair for him to plop into. No problem. An empty chair is located at another table group and dragged across the tile floor, making the same grinding screech as Satan's pet goose. Satisfied, he plops in, and with a tip of the brim, breaks out lunch. Two bags, two enormous things of fries, and a big gulp cup. He starts unwrapping this feast in front of me, carefully peeling back the grease-infused paper like it's Christmas morning. I know that he's a chow hound, but this is just insane. I got you some lunch! Oh, did you sprinkle in a side of Rohypnol just for me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I had to sneak off campus to get it. He says this like he just Mission impossible his way into a Burger King, when in reality, sneaking off campus involves nothing more than walking out the back doors with dozens of other underclassmen. I've already got lunch, Sam, I said, indicating my small plate of sushi. That's your fucking lunch? Jesus, Lady Saber. No wonder you're so skinny. You need to eat more. Because you're just the gold standard of dietary health. <laughs> Sam, if you're going to be mean, I'm not going to talk to you today. I had recently started Sir Sam on a diet, figuratively speaking. If he said something mean, gross, or made a sad attempt at negging, I'd tell him so and stop responding for the rest of the day. He's moved past having a temper tantrum at this point and will either sulk or furiously backpedal. Okay, okay, it was just a fucking joke. Seriously, though, lunch, I got two burgers, and fries, plus a drink. Being a communist, socialist, fascist, terrorist European, I'm not overly fond of hamburgers or fast food. I don't like the taste, and the greasy texture makes me want to gag. I don't mind soda, but that cup looks like it's the size of my torso. I don't even think I could drink that much water. I've got my own lunch, Sam. No thanks. Sam looks a little frustrated, but can't see a way to talk me into it. So he dives into the buffet, inhaling both cups of fries with his mouth vacuum, before demolishing one double-stacked burger. 
food goes in, tiny projectiles of meat slurry are ejaculated back. You can't explain that. <laughs> I shift to the side, trying to keep my plate and eye out of the blast radius of this volcanic eruption. I listen to sloppy mouth chewing while my appetite disintegrates like soggy cheese puffs. Ugh. By now, Sir Sam has pulled out his phone and begun his odd way of stimulating conversation. He loads a video on YouTube, cranks up the volume on the speakers, and overacts his reaction to said video. I hope people do that with Red X. <laughs> Today, the video of choice is an episode of The Atheist Experience, though I hadn't heard of it yet. Try as I might to tune out the low-quality blaring audio, it's Sam's over-the-top, Oh man, he fucking got told! that pushes me over. Sam, can you turn that off? It's really loud. It's the atheist experience! Thank you for providing the appropriate answer to my request. I'm about to respond, but I must have given away a confused look because he immediately cuts me off. You've never heard of the atheist experience? OMG, no I haven't! Please tell me more, 111! Dude, whoa, cool! No, but- Oh man! It's the press! These guys take calls from like, religious whack jobs and totally show them up every time. It's so funny! <laughs> You've really never heard of it before? No, I haven't. Wanna watch this episode with me? Romantic. <laughs> Sorry Sam, doesn't sound like my thing. Oh no! Please don't tell me that you go to church! He phrases this almost rhetorically, like he knows someone who's almost as smart as he is wouldn't possibly fall for the diverse intellectual fallacies of organizationalized religion, right? Yeah. I'm an agnostic, but I still go to Catholic Church. Do I believe what they spout? No, for the most part. Do I support the doctrine? Absolutely not. My father is religious though, so we go as a family. And I've always enjoyed the community and volunteer stuff. I know a number of other church-going atheists who feel the same way. However, in a moment of madness, I challenge him to a battle of wits. For the princess! To the death! He accepts. I accept. Seriously? Super serial. Yes, I go to church. Sam isn't quite sure how to respond to this. So he leans over the desk and rests his forehead against the side of his hand. After a few seconds of despondence at the magnitude of my lady's ignorance, he collects his jimmies and presses onwards. Why? Seriously, how could you support the most genocidal organization known to man? Because my family's religious, so I go with them. Oh, well, it's not really your fault for being indoctrinated. I mean, <laughs> so was I, but then I learned to think for myself. <laughs> I can see where this is going, so I try to disengage. I go to work with my nail file, attempting to overact my disinterest in this topic. However, subtlety is not exactly Sam's strong suit. I know, I'm a slow learner. The euphoric gentle sir cannot neglect this opportunity to enlighten my lady. Still, I think everyone has a responsibility to liberate themselves from that institution. The church just doesn't do anyone any good at all. And it never has. They've just been killing other people and each other for thousands of years. And all because of religion. And they use their Bible to justify it. There's just no point, And nothing good ever comes out of it. He talks in circles like this for a full ten minutes before running out of steam. And having to rehydrate with whatever's sloshing around in that now half-empty big gulp. And I have managed to grind a flat spot in my thumbnail. Damn it. Remember how I mentioned the volunteer stuff? But what about all the charity work that people do? You said it yourself. People do. They don't need the church. People should just do good things just for being good. Not because they think a magic sky wizard wants them to. He's leaning halfway across the table, hands clasped mightily in the center. I actually looked up the atheist experience afterwards, and I realized that Sam was trying his hardest to imitate one of the guys on the show. It hurts to think about. I halfway agree with his thought, but... Without the church, wouldn't it be kind of hard to find a platform to do charity work? Nonsense! I wish I was kidding. Anyone can start a charity and do good deeds. Okay, what's one that you know of? He can't actually name any, and instead falls back on, I think if you're a truly good person, you don't need the promise of heaven. I think that if you're a truly good person, you do good things, but 
I'm not smart enough to understand Sir Sam's intellectual reasonings anyways. Sir Sam's anger is starting to bubble like a shaken dew bottle, but he's straining to keep it civil. The second burger is made as a sacrifice to his stress <laughs> and devoured in three bites, just before he's saved by the bell and makes a quick exit. That evening, right on cue, Facebook gets doused like a Gitmo detainee. <laughs> this post and this argument are the only survivors. Indubitably, brilliant persons still manage to fall victim to the disgusting organizationalized destruction of independent understanding called church. If you side with science, logic will never fail you. Please don't feed the church. You know, not everyone who's religious is a bad person. Yep. Not true. By maintaining the lineage of murderous bloodshed that is fraught preceding millennia, you're perpetuating identical logical fallacies and further systemized depression of enlightened persons. Lol, what? <laughs> Bonus points for SAT words. Seriously though, how am I supporting stuff like the Spanish Inquisition by going to church even though I'm not a Catholic? Protestant churches are offshoots of the Catholic hierarchical system. They're really products of the same topiary. Okay, whatever that was supposed to mean. God has helped a lot of people though through hard times, myself included, and guess what? I didn't need to hurt anyone. Those people who did bad things in the Lord's name will know God and get their judgment, just like everyone else, including you. <laughs> That's hilarious. In all seriousness, the ones who can judge others are others themselves. There's no magic invisible wizard in the sky who's going to let you spend the rest of eternity doing whatever people do in heaven. Because you're Protestant, your god will probably not even let you in the pearly gates, even if he was real. Also, heaven is hotter than hell. I think it's really funny that I know more about the Bible than religious people. I'm so glad that we've taken a moment to bask in that shining, euphoric enlightenment. Similarly to his femmanism, Sam's atheism is a long-term ordeal, and I can't document every delicious encounter at length, would that I could, without sacrificing other parts of the saga. Sir Sam Tries to Nerd should be the next story. What a douche. I kind of follow along the lines of Lady Saber. I don't go to church, personally, but I'm not going to fault people that do, you know what I mean? My wife is a Catholic, I'm a Protestant, but kind of they're just words. <laughs> like I think if you have good in your heart, then you don't have anything to worry about. Sir Sam obviously does not have good in his heart because he's trying at every twist and turn to manipulate his way into Lady Saber's pants, ain't that right? <laughs> Isn't there something in the Bible about don't cast judgment or something? And I got nothing against atheists or agnostics or Buddhists or whatever you are, as long as you aren't out there trying to judge other people and force them into your way of thinking. We can, we can all be cool, we can have different beliefs, believe it or not, and still be friends. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's only when somebody decides that you, you have to see this their way that things start to fall apart. But then again, Sir Sam seems like he's been falling apart for years, so <laughs> maybe this is just what we should come to expect. Anyways, we'll get one more story in here and then I gotta get out of here, do some New Year's stuff. So that means there'll be one more part of the Sir Sam saga. And I thank you guys so much for riding along with me. Let's get into it. Sir Sam tries to charity or how a neckbeard got in the back door. Hello, my lords and my ladies. It's Lady Saber, back with the 10th installment of Sir Sam. This story takes place about a week after the previous two. As a note to new readers, this being the 10th installment of the story, re-explaining the background for all the settings and such wouldn't be much fun for the regulars. My lady bot is somewhere in the comments with all of the previous stories, so grab a bucket of cheese balls and start there. Let's get our jimmies ready. Player one is me, Lady Saber. Pretty social personality, but uncomfortable in large groups of people that I don't know. I'm wearing a dark blue full-length dress, matching earrings and nude heels. My hair's let down and curled gently over one shoulder to cover the cut on the side of my face. Player two is John, my finally official boyfriend. He's looking sharp, wearing a white shirt under a matching light blue vest and tie, pressed pants and polished shoes. He's a much smoother dancer than I am, has a bit of a temper, and will inflate when provoked. It's pretty funny. Player 3 is Sir Samuel Smoothcheeks, the chaste and chivalrous knight. Creepier than a millipede's legs, he has a high-pitched voice and needs lotion to slip through doorways. I would describe his appearance, but I'm saving that little morsel for later. 
So this story takes place mostly at our school's winter dance. It's not quite the prom, but it's still a black tie affair. It's hosted on February the 14th and raises money for a charity. This year, it's supporting a local women's shelter and support network in the city. There are a bunch of silly traditions that everyone follows. The girls ask the guys to be their dates. There's a race between someone in a chicken suit and the school mascot afterward. All this stuff is designed to drum up interest and get more people to buy tickets. The week before the 14th, Sam pays me a visit at Go Club. The whole scene reminds me of the beginning to Lose Yourself by Eminem. If you had one shot, one opportunity to seize everything that you wanted to capture, just let it slip. He makes a big show of himself, making his proposal in front of everyone at Go Club. He's wearing his usual beard gear, TM, with extra crust. He scratches his head before extending the same hand for me to shake. Ugh. <laughs> Yo, his palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. This vomit on his sweater already. Mom's spaghetti. He's nervous, but on the surface he looks calm already. Okay, I don't think those weird stains are actually puke, but he smells bad enough. <laughs> the axe makes a cover about as good as this cover. And, uh... He shifts his weight a few times and goes through a series of nervous ticks before smoothing out his jimmies and asking, Lady Sable, do you want to, like, go with me to, like, the winter dance thingamabob? To drop bombs, but he keeps on forgetting what he wrote down. The whole crowd goes so loud, he opens his mouth, but the words won't come out. I just, uh, you know, think it'd be, like, a lot of fun, and I mean, like, all my friends are going, so it'll be a big group, and, like, I think it'll be a lot of fun. There's a pause. I, I got you something. He produces a small bouquet of white chrysanthemums and roses from his backpack, crinkled and slightly wilted. I don't know why, but this memory always reminds me of macaroni art. Time's up! Over! Blow! <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning that in Belgium, those are the flowers that you bring to a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blushing bright red, it's dead quiet, and everyone is looking at me, including Mr. Teacher, who is trying to hold back a cringe giggle. <laughs> Sam, I'm going with John. Snap back to reality, oh, there goes gravity, oh, there's rabbit, he choked and he's so mad but he won't give up that easy, nope. There's more shock on his face than the victim of an electric chair. How could I reject him? He did all the things right. He had a compelling speech, an irresistible gift, and he even proved his alphaness by ignoring the traditional rules of the dance. He quickly falls back to, Well, I mean, <laughs> just as, as friends, of course. <laughs> Much in the same way that one might fall from a roof. I tell him again that I'm going with John. Well, has he asked you yet? Well, no. <laughs> well, looks like you're pretty much as single as a pringle. <laughs> no, Sam. John is still my boyfriend, and I can't have two dates. He turns and slouches away, tossing the flowers into the trash can with as much reluctance as throwing out a can of raviolis. <laughs> he glances over his shoulder to make sure that I'm watching the symbolic gesture. The rest of the club starts buzzing as Sam storms out. I didn't actually ask John until a few days before, just to make him sweat a little. The dance is held off campus at a large indoor venue. Nice high ceilings, great acoustics, hardwood floors. One wall is almost all windows, so from the outside you can see everyone having a good time. And from the inside you can see who's arriving. John and I buy our tickets at the door. You pay 20, 30, or 50 dollars for a ticket, so John drops 60 for both of us. Ball in. <laughs> it's a fun time. There's a ton of snacks and almost everyone has showed up. Sam, however, is blessedly absent. I get to have a night of fun, unimpeded, by his beardism. <laughs> right. About half an hour in, a limousine pulls up outside the building. It's cleverly disguised as Sam's minivan. <laughs> Sam and six other members of the invasion force pile out one side, kicking and bumping each other through the sliding door. It's a mixed munchies bag. Half are skinny and half are fat. All but one is wearing a hat. Tee hee. That rhymes. <laughs> I grab John and we move to a place where we can see the lobby to watch the Mummers troop enter through the front doors. A banana cop who prevents them from going inside without tickets is nearly eaten. Apparently they have no idea that this is a charity event because there's a significant scuffle at the ticket table. John and I are transfixed, nomming a handful of grapes while the plaid armored hedge knights argue about the tickets before angrily leaving. 
They pace on the sidewalk outside, peering in the window like well-fed Le Miserable orphans, before walking off in the other direction. I think I've dodged a firing squad until the next line dance. I'm grabbing a drink when Sir Sam cha-chas real smooth up behind me, laying a warm, sweaty palm on my exposed shoulder. <laughs> Hello, Seymour. Happy Valentine's Day. Seven, save us. He's wearing brown loafers, khakis, a plaid flannel shirt tucked in under a dark suit jacket, a crooked striped tie, and a pinstripe navy blue trilby to top it all off. My eyes! Oh yes, and I forgot, the cane! Yes, a dark straight cane is in his other hand, leaning away from his hip. Nymeria's 10,000 what? I have to pull myself out of the euphoria to respond. You too? I thought I saw your group leave just now. <laughs> yeah, we went to the school first because we thought we were supposed to go there. Then they wanted to charge us some retarded amount of money to get in here. You know, it's for charity, right? He's surprised by that, but tries to hide it. <laughs> yeah, we knew, but still, $20 is way too much. <laughs> that good old atheism charity, huh? I'm about to ask how he managed to get in when I notice the semicircle of his compatriots forming up around him. I'm by myself, pinned between them and the snack table, a little worried about a stampede. <laughs> From here, I'll just refer to Sam's friends by the color trilby that they're wearing. Blue lifts his hat by the brim in greeting, revealing a sweaty crust of blonde hair underneath. So, you're the Lady Samba we heard so much about. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I laugh nervously. Each gentle sir introduces himself with a tip. Mr. White, Mr. Blue, Mr. Black, Mr. Navy, Mr. Green, and Hatless. They're all dressed in a similarly ridiculous array as Sir Sam, though none can top his cane. Mr. Gray and Mr. Navy are skinny, and the only one that looks like he's googled men's formal wear is hatless. The circle presses in a little tighter, as an unintelligible flood of compliments surge at me like a shaken up bottle of dew. Wow, your dress looks good. You look good in that dress. Is your hair really blonde? Hey, it's cute. How much you like games? You so cute. You don't need any makeup. Mr. Black tries to touch my hair. I'm quickly saved as John and company force an opening into the circle and pull me out as a spokesperson from the beneficiary takes to the stage to give a speech. Everyone shuts up and turns to listen, except for the world's greatest feminist. <laughs> Sam sidles up on my right side. John already occupies my left and has an arm around my waist. The speaker starts with her spiel, and Sam has a witty remark for every other line. We've managed to raise almost $100,000. <laughs> yeah, because you fucking overcharge everyone. For an optional charity event. I've been working for this organization for years. Probably just because your boss likes your tits. <laughs> Feminism. Wow. She runs the damn thing. And I just wanted to tell you how grateful I am for all of this generosity. Yeah, we're like paying your fucking salary. They're all volunteers. After each hilarious one-liner, Sam turns to look at me, making sure I'm able to bask in the warm, moist glow of his good comedic taste. I make no reply, pretending to be intent on the speaker, but that doesn't stop Sir Sam. Milady clearly just didn't hear her champion's japes. <laughs> japes? <laughs> I pronounce it to be the most whimsical jape of the season. <laughs> <laughs> he also fidgets and itches himself while edging closer, making it painfully clear that he wants to touch me, somehow. This continues for the entirety of the five to ten minute talk. John is getting wound up, silently squeezing my waist like a cheese whiz packet. Sam blithely continues on with his humor until the people around us start to shush him. Like any classy alpha male gentleman, he makes mocking faces but eventually stops talking. Eventually though, he chances one last remark to win Milady's hands. Sam leans in close and drops his voice low. It's pretty funny. <laughs> All of us snuck in through a door around the back. Are you serious? He grins smugly. Milady should clearly be impressed by his cunning. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't even locked. People are such idiots. You cheated a charity out of more than a hundred dollars. He doesn't see a problem with this at all. In fact, it's almost an accomplishment. Yeah, so? We showed up and gave our support. They already have tons of money. By now, a roar of applause goes up and people start to make their exit. 
John and I make our escape like the last two egg noodles at the end of his speech and lose ourselves in the crowd. It isn't until after the chicken race that Sam is able to locate us again. Hey, Lady Sable! <laughs> Sorry I lost you guys earlier. Can you give me a ride home? Again? <laughs> John and I have separated as I'm waiting for him to bring his truck back from the parking lot. So I'm pretty much as single as a Pringle, right? <laughs> I don't have a ride. My mom just dropped us off. Could you take me home? What about your friends? Oh, well, I guess they need a ride too. <laughs> How many people can you fit? I don't know, Sam. It's not my car. There's a few awkward minutes of standing around before John returns. The rest of the Beatus Brigade starts to trickle in. John finally pulls up next to the sidewalk, and Sam makes like a rabbit kin to hop on in. Heh, <laughs> that rhymes. <laughs> He's clambered halfway through the passenger door when John tries to stop him. Sam, what the hell are you doing? I need a ride, John. Dude, I don't have space for you and your herd. Well, how am I supposed to get home then? What would this evening be without a good vintage wine? <laughs> Sam, that ain't really my problem. He backs out and stands on the road, giving his hat a tip and holding the already open door for me as I climb in the cab. <laughs> I don't want to think about what he's looking at as he's standing behind me. Hey John, do you think we can ride in the back? You mean the truck bed? Yeah, there's plenty of room. I'm more worried about the towing capacity than the room. <laughs> Sam, I don't even know where you guys live, and I can't spend all night driving around. John and I exchange a look of, why do we even need to have this conversation? It's okay. We all live close by. Mr. White just lives over in Bumshartville. <laughs> That's like a half an hour away. Seriously, just call your mommy and get her to pick you guys up. Lady Saber and I have to go. Please? Can you just drop us off at my house then? My mom can't pick us up. We're going to be stuck here and like, it's cold. <laughs> Got a layer of blubber to keep you warm, don't you? John and Sam don't actually live that far apart, but more on that later. It might have been easy to just drive away, but John relents and they climb into the truck bed. Sam still makes a bid to share the front seat with Milady, but the door is mysteriously locked. <laughs> From the huffing and puffing, you'd think that they just scaled the wall barehanded. Mr. Gray, who can't physically manage it, has to be hoisted up. <laughs> After the whole crew is in, Sam slaps the back window twice, leaving a greasy palm print. Hatless was nowhere to be seen, but everyone forgot about that at the time. The ride home is comical. Hold on to your trilbies, folks! Part of this ride is on the freeway, and at 60 miles an hour, even the crustiest hair flaps in the breeze like soggy potato chips. Sam hoots and hollers while a few members of his team look like they're about to be sick. Less than a mile from his house, Sam loses his hat. He looks like he's about to cry, <laughs> but he puts on a brave face. The original plan was to drop me off first, but I really don't want these guys knowing where I live, so the gentle sirs are dropped off before me. At Sam's house, sure enough, his minivan is happily parked in the driveway. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> You'd think if Sir Sam didn't spend so much money on hats <laughs> and ridiculous ploys for Milady's affection, he, he would have been able to buy a minivan of his very own already. But no, it just keeps on coming with the... The whimsical japes. <laughs> I love that LP used that word. God! That is just choice. <laughs> so wonderful. Uh, I'd really like to continue with the uh, Sir Sam saga, but we're going to have to save it for a part three. It might even be a beefy part three. I think there's about five parts left. So roughly all around the same size, an hour each. And then I'll cut it into like a three and a half hour video as a nice treat. I think it's super funny that John took Sir Sam down the freeway with like, <laughs> with like a bunch of lardos in the back. That's hilarious. Let Highway Patrol see that. You're going to be pulled over in like less than a second. <laughs> and then imagine them all jumping out and trying to run away. <laughs> Comedy gold. I probably would have like jerked him around even a little bit more. Go into a parking lot and do some donuts and stuff. I remember one time me and my little brother were in the back of my stepdad's truck. <laughs> Bad idea. He thought it was super funny to like slam on the brakes and we totally flew into the back side of the truck, hit the tailgate. I smacked my head super hard, which probably explains some things about me now that I come to think about it. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe <laughs> the story's true. 
The rest of it, uh, I can't speak on it. You let me know what you think in the comments. Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to sports. Or how I got smacked with a neck planet shuttlecock. Hey everyone, Lady Saber here, back with the 11th installment of Sir Sam the Chivalrous. New readers, we've gotten pretty far along in this series, and you'll want to go back and read the earlier editions so this story makes more sense. Miladybot will be somewhere in the comments. He is your friend, Zone. And since we're watching this on YouTube, check out the uh, links in the description for the previous parts if you haven't yet. Anyways, player one is me, Lady Saber of House Snark. I'm pretty athletic, but it's mostly reserved to a few specific activities. Most of my classes have changed for the new semester, so I spend a lot of time meandering in the enormous school building like a stupid freshman. Player two is, most regrettably, Sir Sam the Chaste and Chivalrous. He wears standard neck planet attire of cargo shorts, a graphic tee that's far too tight, and a wide-brimmed brown fedora, as well as a heavy musk of Axe's hottest fragrance, Teenage Angst, or maybe it's Pretentious Ejaculator. <laughs> it's hard to tell. He's a chronic underachiever, taking the lowest level credits offered and treating his failing grades like an accomplishment. As such, he doesn't share any of my classes. Yet. Uh-oh. Ominous. <laughs> a minor player three is my counselor, Sisel. He isn't a very agreeable person, but he and I have to work pretty closely to assure that my credits satisfy both the school and my exchange program. All of my classes are semester long, so after exams, my whole schedule changes. I'm taking creative writing, chemistry, sociology, and pre-calc. It isn't until a few days into these classes that Sisel summons me into his office. As it happens, the school requires students to take at least two gym credits to graduate, because I'm planning for a lot of AP classes in my 11th and 12th year. I decide to switch sociology for the last open gym course. The next day, I head for my new class, Net Games. Oh, I play a lot of Net Games, bro. You ever play uh, Dota? Maybe some Rainbow Six Siege? Oh, it's not that kind of Net Games. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the gym, on the opposite side of the school from the English department, making for a very long walk. I find the gym easy enough, but it's empty, and I hunt for another five minutes to find the actual classroom. I end up being late Walder Frey, and everyone looks at me like I've just crawled out from under a log, including Sir Sam. There are a few open seats, two of which are on either side of Sam. He excitedly pulls out a chair for me on his left. I opt for the seat on the other side of the room. <laughs> Mr. Castle, our coach, is explaining badminton's rules while Sam gives me occasional glances, turning almost completely in his seat. Subtle as a dynamite charge. <laughs> as ever. Because I've missed the first few days, Mr. Castle dumps a stack of forms onto my desk to take home and sign. We just went over basic introduction stuff the last few days, so you should be good. After our crash course on the rules, everyone moseys out to the lockers to change out. As I stand, Sir Sam scrambles like an egg on an extra cheesy McMuffin to accompany my lady. He holds the door open for me, even though it's stopped open. <laughs> <laughs> the journey to the lockers is a short distance that takes a lifetime. The hallway is wide, but the tight crowd and number of turns makes the trip sufficiently awkward with Sam lumbering by my side. He makes intriguing conversation as we walk. So, net games, huh? Uh, yeah. Cool, cool. <laughs> I only signed up for this class because I thought it meant, like, net games. I mean, games you play on the internet. You know, on a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I fall right in line with Sam on that one. I'd like some vinaigrette with my word salad. Oh, uh, okay. Based on the number of other students who have yet to see the sun this year, he is not alone in his mistake. I managed to deflect conversation long enough to reach the door to the girls' room, and I half expect Sam to try and follow me inside. Before I can stop him, someone else does the honor. We'll call her Bree. Yo, what are you doing? Uh, nothing. Just talking to Lady Saber. Neato! This is the girls' locker, so why don't you find someone else who doesn't want to talk to you, okay? Bree is a big girl, and has obviously practiced the jock persona well. Sam considers holding his ground, but backs off with his face red and his fists clenched. As we change, Bree and I talk. So, how you liking your new boyfriend? Sam? 
Oh, we're not I'm playing with you. That kid's a creep. You're that exchange student, right? That's me. Bree eventually asks about my scar and offers to tell a few of the more fantastical versions of the story that have been passed around. Hang out with me today. He won't fuck with you. While piling back into the hallway, Bree and I get separated in the crowd. At the end of the hall, Sam catches up with me like a freight train to a loaded school bus. He's still wearing the same getup, fedora included. What he did with his 10 minutes in the locker room, I don't want to know. <laughs> hey, Lady Saber. What's up? I can't wait for this class to be over. Me neither. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> I'm not even going to do anything in here. It's not like anyone could actually make me. Those are about all the words he can spit out before we're in the gym. Mr. Castle comes in behind the class, and we take a seat on the bleachers while he explains what the plan is for the day. Sir Sam plops down to my left, slouching back and taking up far more than a reasonable space. Bree is on my right, and I feel like I'm about to be drawn and quartered between a she-wolf and a buttered rhinoceros. <laughs> Uh, while Mr. Castle briefly explains daily gym routine, Bree and I maintain a strained conversation as a pretense for ignoring Sam. He refuses to be left out. As Bree and I talk, Sam oh so subtly scoots closer and tries to insert himself into our conversation, laughing boisterously at our jokes. Bree scoots in the other direction, giving me space to scoot away. Sam follows right along, making a delightful scooter puff train. <laughs> choo choo! <laughs> This goes on for almost half a meter. I try holding up my palm for personal space and get a high five. <laughs> Bree has a pretty weak stomach for cringe. Bruh, Sam, you need to give Lady Saber some damn space. What are you talking about, random girl I don't know? Dude, seriously? Do you have any idea what personal space is? Not soon enough, Mr. Castle rouses us to do some warm-ups. Sir Sam has already decided that... Warm-ups are beneath him. He and a few others stay sitting, while the rest of the class go through the motions of running laps, a round of suicides, and a few basic stretches. All the while, Sir Sam is just watching me. His face is slightly lost. He desperately wants to follow me around, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with Bree. He continues to overthink his strategy until the class finally finishes. We go to work setting up the badminton nets, and Sam is pretty much the only one still sitting out. Mr. Castle's had enough of it, and after a minute of persistent berating, Sam reluctantly gives in, but with Bree by my side, he still holds his distance. As it turns out, I'm actually pretty good at badminton. Mr. Castle lets us all free play and strolls around to give people some advice. Bree and I start out together, but we eventually decide to split up and find some other matches during the last few minutes of class. No sooner is Bree left, than Sam swoops in, for a chance to win my lady's heart. Tipping his fedora in greeting. Hey, Lady Saber. Wanna play a game? Uh, everyone else is paired off in singles or doubles. I'm now trapped like Frodo in Shelob's lair. I was actually just about to grab some water. You've hardly done anything. <laughs> you too. I shrug that off and push through the double doors into the hall. I spend as long as I can drinking and stand around for a little longer before going back in. Sure enough, most people have switched around, but the faithful Sir Sam is still waiting for me. <laughs> you must have been thirsty. I have no idea what to say to that either, but Sam is always happy to fill in the blanks. We're gonna play, right? Sam, I thought you said you weren't gonna do anything in this class. Well, yeah, but I didn't think we were gonna play badminton. That's easy. You know how to play? Ah, oh, yeah. I used to play with my friends a lot. It's easy. It's glaringly obvious that he's never played before. Trying to serve overhand, he holds the racket sideways for a swing and whiff three times before trying underhand. That one works, if hitting under the net counts. Out of bounds seems to change with each return. First it's that line, and then it's this line, and then it's somewhere sort of between those two lines and I always manage to land just barely on the wrong side of it. It's like playing checkers with a pigeon. At one point, Mr. Castle stops by and tries to give Sam a little help with his technique, with enough, yeah, okay, whatever, and yeah, yeah, I know that. He moves on to the next person. 
After only a few rounds, another guy joins our game. He jumps in on my side, and Sam reacts immediately. Hey! Two on one isn't fair! Okay, maybe you two could be together. No! Little the favor, you and I should be on a team! Sir Sam aside, I still enjoy the game. I consider sitting it out, but I am not going to be kept from something new that I like. Plus, he'd probably just sit it out with me to make sure that I was safe. Alright then. Luckily for me, there's not a whole lot of playing to do. Sam insists on trying to return every shot in protection of my lady's honor. My job is to hold the racket, look ready, and dance out of the way while Sam dives for the shots on my side of the court. <laughs> it's kind of like playing underwater tag with a beluga. The other guy we're playing with is deliberately hitting towards my side, trying to give me something to return. When it's Sam's turn to serve, my turn is always next time. Sometimes he'll randomly hit it towards me, really fast. Hey, watch out! <coughs> Think fast, Lady Saber! <laughs> the best part? I'm on Fedora Patrol. When his suede great helm takes a tumble, I'm supposed to get it. Hey, Lady Saber, will you grab my hat? You dropped it, Sam. Yeah, but you're closer! Was there ever so sweet a sound as two whistle blasts? <laughs> <laughs> As the class starts to take down the nets and put away the gear, Bree catches up with me again, and Sam sheepishly retreats to a safe distance, remaining there for the rest of class. After school that day, I storm into Sycel's office and beg for a class change. I stay for almost two hours, making everything from angry demands to crocodile tears. Finally, he relents and lets me switch back to my original schedule. I promise to make up the credit next year, planning to hunt for threatening course titles like Full Contact Sports Level 3. <laughs> oh, Sir Sam, how I have missed thee. Thee and thy cringe. Holding open a door that's already stopped open. That is so hilarious. Oh, I love that he thought it was net games. I mean, that was a joke that I made in the beginning, but he seriously did think that it was net games. I wonder if Sir Sam is actually any good at video games. He doesn't seem like a coordinated type. And while some video games don't necessarily take coordination, he also doesn't seem to be like the strategic type. <laughs> That's even demonstrated in this story where he's like, oh, I'm just going to sit on the side. I'm not going to do anything. And then Lady Saber gets up and he's like, oh, now I'm going to do something. <laughs> Bro, stick with the plan, okay? I probably would have kept that jock girl by my side the whole time. She'd be like, let's split up and find other partners. And I'd be like, no. <laughs> You promised to save me. Stay right here. <laughs> and then we could have avoided this whole situation. Although I guess having Shuttlecox lobbed at you was good motivation to go to the counselor and try and get the class changed. So all's well that ends well. I suppose we shall see how things devolve once again in the next story. <laughs> Sir Sam the Chivalrous goes on a venture. <laughs> Part 1. Or how my personal time is being hunted... To extinction! Hey everyone, it's Lady Saber, back with the 12th installment of Sir Sam the Chivalrous. This story takes place shortly after the previous one. For you new readers, we're pretty far along by this point, so you'll definitely want to go back and read the earlier versions. Player 1 is Lady Saber from across the narrow sea. I'm 16 at the time, foreign exchange student, slowly learning how to America. <laughs> I've always been a relatively outdoorsy person. But finding people to do things with can be tough. Regardless, I have a lot of experience backpacking, biking, and skiing in Europe before coming here, also Catholic. To the meeting, I wear cutoffs on a tank with my favorite leather jacket. Player two is my boyfriend, John. He lives pretty far out in the country, and his favorite outdoor things aren't too different from mine. He dresses like a normal person with an obnoxiously large belt buckle. He has dark, short hair. Stands about 1.8 meters tall, 5 foot 10 for you plebeians, which is a thumb over Sir Sam. He has a southern accent that I could listen to all day. What's up with the obnoxiously large belt buckle? Before they got together, she's like, I love his belt buckle. And now she's like, eh, <laughs> it's too big. <laughs> Player three, for some reason, keeps being Sir Sam the chivalrous, the smoothest cheeked neck beard of all. He has no experience outdoors of any kind. This has no bearing, of course, on his ability to be the best and most informed camper the world has ever known. He's fatter than your average Tumblr user. 
He has a squeaky, high-pitched voice. He usually reeks of death and acts as new as body fray. Oh, the douche. Terminally diagnosed with nice guy TM syndrome and prone to outbreaks of euphoria. For those who may not know, venture scouting is a lot like boy scouting, but it's got some major differences. For one, it's co-ed, so both guys and girls can join. Additionally, it's for an older age group, 14 to 21 instead of 10 to 18, and we do more high adventure stuff that Boy Scouts aren't allowed to do because of silliness like SAFETY. <laughs> John has been venturing for a while, and it's not hard to convince me to come to a meeting. We discuss it at school, he gives me the information, and I agree to show up. I've got a few friends in various clubs that might be interested, so I make the announcement at French Club and Go Club during the week. Did you hear that? It was a nail. Tip, tip, tipping its way into my casket. <laughs> Sunday afternoon rolls around, and my host mother gives me a ride to the church where they meet. I'm slightly early, but I go inside to meet a few of the other people who have already arrived. One of the adults gives me a membership packet. It's about five pages long, mostly demographic information with some reading about the program. I tuck myself away in a corner to write against the wall and get pretty engrossed in the material as most people arrive. Before long, I'm interrupted. Hey, Lady Saber! <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ on a tricycle. Here? Sam? He made even less of an effort for this meeting. He's wearing a dark hoodie with a stretched out frocket. Accessorized with weird stains, <laughs> cargo shorts filled to bursting with euphoria and atheism, and a small green trilby was perched atop his head. I still have no idea how many of those damn hats he has. Yeah, I saw the flyer you left at Go Club. <laughs> Too bad I wasn't there to see you, huh? You look dashing today. He's fishing for an ego boost, but I refuse to bite. I didn't know you were into outdoor stuff. Subtle neg is subtle. <laughs> what, like camping and shit? Yeah, that's easy. I've been doing that ever since I was a kid. What's that paper thing in my bob? It's an application to join the crew. You should grab one from one of the adults. He retrieves a packet from the crew advisor and schleps a chair across the floor and plops down right next to me, panting from the slight effort. <laughs> He's relatively focused, on me at least covertly glancing at my thighs while reading. It isn't until he gets to the venturing oath that he stops. As a venturer, I promise to do my duty to God and help strengthen America, to help others and to seek truth, fairness, and adventure in our world. Whoa, Lady Saber, have you read this venture oath thing of my mob? Yeah? I can't believe they want us to conform to this shit. <laughs> I mean, I know you're religious, but even you gotta see that it's stupid, right? I am not in the mood to have this conversation today. You know you can't be here if you're an atheist, Sam. What do you mean? I mean, they won't let you join. That's retarded! I should be able to do whatever I want! It's just the rules, Sam. With that, I excuse myself and return the packet to the crew advisor, hoping beyond hope that Sam's euphoria will overcome his fixation on me. <laughs> the membership fee is $50, but I'm told not to worry about the money for now. As I finish speaking with the crew advisor, someone taps me on the shoulder from behind. Lady Saber! Not exactly the voice I expected. I turn on my heel to find myself face to face with Sam's mother. Mrs. Sam? Hey! It's great to see you here! Sam told me you invited him to this little event! Was it that club y'all started together? My brain is struggling to wade through whatever bullshit I imagine Sam has been feeding his mother, and I only managed to address part of it. Go club? Yeah, I made an announcement, but I don't think Sam was there. I just left a flyer. Oh, well, it still sounds like a neat little thingy. I had no idea that groups like this existed. Do you go camping much? Yeah, I have experience back home, but none here. Well, Sam will have a great teacher! He's never been! I don't know where the sudden interest came from, but it should be good exercise! I have an inkling where the interest is coming from, but I decide to keep my mouth shut. And Mrs. Sam excuses herself while the meeting starts. John, at long last, arrives. I pinch him for stranding me with Sam. 
Not that either of us expected him, of all people, to show up. Sam remains at a safe distance while the meeting gets underway. There are about 15 people present, evenly split between guys and girls, with five or so being adults. Sam and I get introduced together in front of everyone. I'm first, speaking a little about my experiences back home and why I'm interested in joining the crew. Sam introduces himself with a flourish, fully removing his trilby for the swooning of all milady's presents. <laughs> he talks much too loud for the small room, regaling everyone at length about how much he loves camping and I'm so glad my good friend Lady Saber invited me here. I grimace. <laughs> The two of us get a smattering of applause, and I exit stage right. Ah, a smattering of indifference. <laughs> During the meeting, we sit around folding tables arranged in an irregular polygon. Imagine a square with rickets. <laughs> Sam sits across from me, staring daggers at John, while two people give a short presentation on how to pack a backpack for an overnight trip. To acquiesce milady's attentions, he makes utterly hilarious comments. No one laughs, clearly unable to appreciate a jest of such superior intellect. Weight is super important. Your pack shouldn't be more than 30% of your body mass, so only bring what you need. Does that include textbooks? What? <laughs> you said your backpack shouldn't weigh more than 30%, so should I put my textbooks in, or no? Sam is grinning like a Cheshire cat in spite of himself. The poor presenters have no idea how to handle this gracefully. <laughs> Most people wouldn't. Uh, well, it's not a school backpack. You don't really need the textbook, so... Oh! <laughs> I was wondering why I'd need to bring all that stuff to school. Crickets. <laughs> this continues the entire time, stretching out the presentation like a victim of the Spanish Inquisition. Sam glances at me to gauge my reaction after each punchline, by the end, everyone is all out of cringe, <laughs> and more than thankful to just move on. The crew is planning to go on a backpacking and fishing trip at the end of the month. We'd park in a campsite on Friday and hike until it gets dark. On Saturday, we'll trek along a small scenic ridge to a private lodge that a friend of the crew owns. Around lunch, we'll fish in the lake and river on his property for a few hours, and after we finish, we'll hike into our campsite. In the morning, we'll have an easy two kilometers or so back to where we started and just drive home. Easy day. Or two. <laughs> there are multiple loops that we can take, which gets us where we need to go. A few topographic maps are passed around, and we quickly narrow our choices to two trails that are the same length we want and avoid steep grades. I peek over at Sam, who's been studying his map for some time, silently tracing his fingers over the paper. He raises a hand to get the crew president's attention and asks, what about this route here that I found? No one else saw it. It goes right through the house and it doesn't curve all over the place. He hoists his map like a Tagarian banner and plants a sausage finger firmly in the center. A few people crowd around to examine exactly what we've all missed. I cast a glance back to my own map lying on the table. After a few seconds, Sam's foolish grin is overshadowed by four confused scowls. He appears to have found the trail that only smart people can see. <laughs> Sorry, dude. I don't see what you're pointing at. What? How? It's, like, right there. He jabs at the map with his finger, shaking it like San Francisco. Uh, dude, that's a topography line. What? No, it's a trail. That's what the snaky black lines are. Everyone knows that. The trails are the dotted lines. The solid lines are topography. It shows elevation change. I know that! I was pointing at the... You know... The... Eh... You know what? Screw it. Just forget it. You don't see what I'm pointing at. There's a brief pause as everyone eyes each other to confirm that what we just saw did indeed happen. Sam slouches back into his chair, struggling to hide his deflation. The crew votes to take the longer route in favor of a more shallow grade. All told, it's about a 20 kilometer loop. When the president asks for a show of hands of who plans to attend, Sam looks at me first before raising his hand too. <laughs> There's a question asked about the food we'll be eating, and the response is only, Philmont rations. I have no idea what this means, but everyone else does apparently, so I stay quiet. Sam, naturally, knows as well. 
Oh man, those are the best! <laughs> I love rations. <laughs> After finishing our planning, the crew circles up and holds hands for a short closing prayer. I pity the girls who have to hold hands with Sam, but I'm still thankful that it isn't me. <laughs> As everyone starts to pack up and leave, I stay to talk with the crew advisor about some other questions that I have. John helps the others to put away the tables and chairs, so Sam sees us the chance to be in my general vicinity. He stands beside me while the crew advisor and I talk, mouth breathing heavily. Sam, did you have a question for me? Uh, no. Lady Saber asked what I was going to already. Before leaving with Sam on my heels, John and I share a heartfelt goodbye. See you, loser. Later, fuckface. <laughs> There's a noted lack of chivalry afterwards, but once I get home, this gem is waiting for me. While there were subsequent posts, none survived the purge. And what was that post, you ask? Let us see. <laughs> I simply cannot comprehend in any condition why brilliant, charming women consciously choose to court rubbish boys with a complete lack of deference or class towards them. Sincerely, one has to contemplate the unfortunate reality that most females simply do not cover the man who grasps their true worth. And he used the wrong there. <laughs> Such an intellectual. <laughs> and of course, he's got some beardy bros that jump in. <laughs> I'm with you, Sam. The number of girls I see with random douchebags who probably beat them on the regular makes me lose faith in humanity. Precisely. When a woman can be publicly demeaned by her so-called boyfriend, and she chooses to remain with him, I grow despondent for nice guys everywhere who actually desire a meaningful relationship. Yeah, this so bad our generation only cares about hookups and notching bedposts rather than finding someone who actually matters. <laughs> I wouldn't date a girl who lets her boyfriend smack her around. She's probably just a desperate slut who wants attention. Desperate slut who wants attention is literally 90% of the girls at my school. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they ain't got much, but at least they got each other. I'm gonna tell you that. It seems like Sam will go to absolutely any length for Lady Saber. <laughs> I don't know why he just doesn't find, like, a fellow leg beard, you know? He hears a 20-kilometer hike, and he's like, That's not that bad. I can do that. <laughs> Are you sure, bro? This next bit's gonna be a fucking disaster. <laughs> oh, there's no way he's gonna make it. 20 kilometers is really not that much if it's spread over a couple of days, but for a beardo like Sam, oh man. I don't honestly know if I could do it myself in my current physical condition. In my Navy days, sure, yeah, why not? But these days, when I spend most of my time being a dad or making YouTube videos, it's, uh, debatable. <laughs> I don't think I would put myself through it, especially not just for fun. And of course, Sir Sam providing the innocent cringe, you know? <laughs> Pretending to see a trail that nobody else can see, and then when he's corrected on what the lines mean, he's like, oh yeah, you guys don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it didn't exist and you can't admit that you are wrong. Oh, and then and then the jokes, the supposed jokes. I use that with air quotations around it. <laughs> Am I supposed to put books in my bag? Everybody's like, what the fuck? <laughs> what is he talking about? Does not compute. Like, it is funny, but only because of the levels of cringe and awkwardness. Which is definitely not what he was going for. He was hoping everybody would be like, ha ha, he's hilarious, bro. What an intelligent observation. <laughs> but instead, everybody's just like, oh God, is this guy really coming with us? Yes, he is. Because he believes in himself and his abilities. Which is a good thing, generally. But you also gotta admit when maybe you're not up to something. Maybe you need a little bit of help with stuff. That's okay too. But he wouldn't be the Sir Sam that we know and love if he ever backed down. <laughs> so, I guess we'll jump into the next one and see just how bad things can get. <laughs> Sir Sam the Chivalrous goes on a venture. Part two, or how my hobbies were saved from the endangered species list. Hello everyone, Milady Saber here. <laughs> this is the first time that she's introduced herself like that 
because this is the lucky 13th installment of Sir Sam the Chivalrous. This story takes place a few weeks after part one. Reading the previous installments would be well worth your time. Trigger warning. This tale encompasses three straight days of interaction with Sir Sam. It is extremely long. We love long stories around here. I'm gonna get it in. Player one is me, Lady Saber of House Snark. Very enthusiastic about backpacking. I've just joined a local venture crew at the beginning of the month. Similar to fencing practice, appearances take a back seat while in the wilderness. Makeup would just be something else to carry around. And I put my hair up in a tight bun or a ponytail to keep it from getting too disgusting. <laughs> Cute outfits get traded for athletic shirts and cargo pants, which I'm sure uh, Sir Sam will enjoy those athletic shirts. <laughs> Player two is my boyfriend, John, also an outdoor person. He's the one who invited me to the first venture meeting. He has a bone dry sense of humor and is much better than I am at keeping a straight face while joking with someone. Player three is Sir Sam, the chivalrous, the whitest knight in all of Westeros. He's likely never spent more than three consecutive hours outside. He wears a baggy long sleeve t-shirt, a wide brimmed blue fedora, brand new hiking shoes, and thick cargo shorts. Finally, at least one of his clothing articles is appropriate for the occasion. In case we've forgotten, Sam has a high-pitched whiny tone of voice which he often employs as an alpha male to get what he wants. <laughs> Minor player four is Jamie, the venture crew president. A year or two older than John and I, he's a pretty average dude, has a lot of backpacking experience, is a fantastic leader, and most importantly, he has a cool head. Like he's level-headed or you like the shape of his head? <laughs> Doesn't matter. On Friday evening, my host mother drops me off in the church parking lot. Most who are going to attend are already present. I turn in a check to pay for the trip and the rest of my medical forms. There are 14 people attending, four of them adults, all split evenly between the genders. I was only barely able to attend this trip. I didn't bring any of my backcountry gear to America as I didn't have enough space on my flight and I didn't think I would have the chance to do any real backpacking. I was wrong, and my father, real MVP, paid a stack to have my gear shipped. I still had to make a stop at REI to pick up a few things like stove fuel that couldn't be put in the mail. MVP indeed. Anyways, I plan to be early, but I'm one of the last to arrive. Everyone is gathered around a large plastic bin, reorganizing their packs. While we all have our personal gear, clothes, sleeping bags, survival stuff, there's a lot more to add. Items like tents, a first aid kit, iodine tabs, a trowel, camp stoves, and of course our food. In examining some of the outdated crew gear, I decided to don my white armor and speak to Jamie. Hey Jamie, I don't want to sound rude, but a lot of this crew gear is really heavy. Oh, hey Lady Saber. The stuff we have isn't the best, but it gets the job done. Don't worry, we split it up so that everyone gets an equal weight. I realize with annoyance that he's lumped me in with Sir Sam. Here's my second chance at a first impression. Yeah, I get that, but I have my own stuff that might work better than what we have. Oh, really? His tone was thick with skepticism. The stoves you have use liquid fuel in a metal canister. Each one weighs almost a kilo. The one I have uses butane fuel. I don't know how fast yours works, but I can boil water in about five minutes. I've got his interest now. I've heard of those. Can you show me? I spend the next few minutes setting up the stove. The burner clicks into place on top of the flat bottom fuel canister. I spin a clicker to throw sparks across a stream of gas, and a blue flame jumps to life. I've drawn a crowd. That's awesome! What else you got? That feel when you prove you know your shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best! <laughs> By the end of my show and tell, I've replaced their two heavy stoves with mine, and the collapsible metal trowel with my high density plastic one. I carry those things plus a carabiner and one of my bear bags. My three-person tent group splits the components up. I carry the poles and the stakes. As we move on to repacking our food, Sam's minivan crests the hill into the parking lot like a carnival roller coaster of dubious safety. <laughs> He's in the driver's seat with Mrs. Sam on the passenger side. As they get close, it's easier to see just how frustrated his expression is. Miss Sam points for him to turn left and Sam bangs on the steering wheel like a corporate dad in traffic. <laughs> I can see by the way his mouth moves that he's raising his voice. They park crooked near the group. Sam squirms out of the driver's seat and opens the back door, producing a fully loaded backpack. 
He shoulders it, hops, and starts clipping all the buckles into place. Once sufficiently mummified, <laughs> he strides towards me, tipping his euphoria in greeting. Hey there, Saber. Looks like I'm right on time. Yeah, I guess. We're splitting up our gear, so make sure you check in. Sam bobs away happily, and I return to repacking our food. The rations we get are sealed in plastic. Each one contains enough for two people. John and I pair up for an eating group. I take Sunday's breakfast and Saturday's dinner. Instead of the entrees included with the sealed rations, we're bringing our own. To repack them, I open the bag, take out the original main course, and replace it with what the crew has provided. With that, my bag is ready to go, along with almost everyone else. Of course, Sam is not quite there yet. He, w <laughs> he was on the attendee list, so his crew gear and food have already been set aside. Upon discovering this, however, my gentle sir is most displeased. Hey, Jamie, what's all this junk? That's your gear, Sam. Ah, uh, no. My stuff is right here. He jerks a thumb over his shoulder. Yeah, but there's other stuff you have to carry for the crew and your food. Stuff that we all need to use. Sam empties his first flagon of wine. But no one else is carrying extra stuff. Why do I have to do it? Sam, we've already packed. Everyone's waiting on you. That gets him moving. He crams a coil of rope and a first aid kit into the top of his bag while Jamie carefully goes over Sam's packing. Hey Sam, I just want to go over some of your gear, okay? Why? Just to make sure you have everything. I've got a list. I have everything I need, Jamie. Great, then this should go quick then. Jamie rattles off his list of essentials, and Sam produces each item after some rummaging with a smug grin. Now, I have to give credit where credit is due. Sam does his homework. It took me years to learn about what to bring, what I need, not to mention buying it all. Sam, doubtless with help from Mrs. Sam, collected all this information in less than a month. If neckbeards are good for anything, it's Googling. <laughs> for the drive, we get reassigned to cars. Guess who's in mine? Not Sam. Gods be praised. <laughs> Hallelujah. John and I ride together with Jamie and another girl that I'm tenting with. After an hour of driving, we park at the campsite, pile out of our cars, and gather ourselves. I, with everyone else, take off my Venture uniform shirt. We're required to wear them to and from our events, but they're not really comfortable or practical to wear during an activity. I start to unbutton my shirt, revealing my tank top underneath, when I notice Sam is watching me. <laughs> he snaps his gaze to the side when I look up at him, but carefully returns when he thinks I'm not looking. Skin crawling. <laughs> I finish changing on the other side of the car. With the sun sinking low, we strike out. John and I walk abreast, alternating between holding hands and punching each other. <laughs> Sir Sam, sensing that his chivalry is needed to protect my lady's honor, wedges himself between John and I, a la our introduction at Chess Club. The trail might be wide enough for two or even three normal-sized humans, but with Sam in the mix, John is forced to go off-roading. John and I fall back behind Sam, so he slows down, so we pick up the pace. The game of Leap Whale <laughs> continues for almost two meters. By the end, however, Sam is lagging further and further behind until he's at the back of the group. Hey, guys! Can we take a break? He's breathing hard enough to stoke a fire and sweating like he's been standing in one despite the cool temperature. Sure thing, Sam. Fiverr, everyone! Jamie sets his watch as Sam unclips his pack and collapses into a heap on the ground. Everyone else remains standing, packs on. Sam, don't sit down. It's just a fiver, bruh. Whoa, what? Wh why? I'm taking a break. You don't sit for a short break, Sam. Makes it harder to keep going. They argue about what one is supposed to do for a five minute break for the next six minutes. <laughs> Which is about as effective as reasoning with a stubborn box of pasta. Thankfully, Jamie has a much cooler head than Sam. When it's time to go, Sam reactivates his passive-aggressive alpha male abilities, taking forever to put on his pack. Watching him don it is a circus all on its own. After a significant struggle and three people helping him, Sam finally gets back on his feet, huffing and puffing. Before we've gone another half kilometer, Sam starts complaining about his feet hurting. Hey, Jamie, 
Can we take a break? It's not going to help your feet, Sam. We got a long way to go to our campsite. <laughs> the crew is forced to match our pace with Sam's. He trails in the rear of the group with the adults giving him a pep talk through every single step. By the end of the fourth kilometer, snails are outrunning us. We're forced to take a 20 minute break so that Sam can catch his breath. It's gotten totally dark, but on we hike at an absolute crawl. At long last, we arrive at our campsite. As my tentmates and I start setting up our tent, Sam stumbles over. Hey, Lady Saber, want a tent together? Um, what? Do you want a tent with me? I have, like, the tent part, and you have the poles. <laughs> no, Sam. Guys and girls can't tent together. Your tentmate is on your side. He opens and shuts his mouth a few times, looking for an argument, before slumping away muttering something to himself. As soon as we finish our tents, we have to hang our bear bags. They're to be filled with food and other smellables that might attract some furry friends. There's a very low likelihood of bears where we're camping, but it's good practice nonetheless. Sam and his tentmate, who we'll call Pip, have taken a long time to set up, so they're fashionably late as we fill the bags. Hanging the bear bags is a chore. We have to throw two ropes over a tree branch about 10 meters up, tie the bags together, hoist them into the air, and then secure the lines to two different trees. Sam, desperate to demonstrate his prowess in the wilderness to my lady, offers to throw one of the ropes. Jamie, echoing our sympathies, is in no mood for shenanigans that might keep everyone awake longer than necessary. In the dark, it's a challenge to hang the bags, but not impossible. After we finish, Jamie tells everyone, Go get some sleep. We'll be waking up early tomorrow morning. Sam is not pleased. Wait, Jamie, aren't we going to have a campfire? Sam, it's almost midnight. Go to bed. But what about our food? I'm hungry. <laughs> we are eating tonight, Sam. You should have had dinner before we left. That was in the email. Don't worry, we'll have some breakfast in the morning. Sam fills another cup of wine in protest, but everyone's already turned in. I snuggle down in my sleeping bag, absolutely dreading the next day. It seems I haven't closed my eyes for more than a few seconds when it's light outside. I'm not sure what time it is, but I let the air out of my sleeping pad and crawl out of the bag. I throw on my clothes, stuff everything into its sack, and peek out into our camp. I'm one of the first ones awake, so I rouse my tent mates and we start breaking everything down. We have a long enough trek today, and I don't want to think about how much longer it's going to take towing Sam like a river barge. <laughs> <laughs> After taking down our tent and splitting up its parts, the bear bags come down, and we spill their contents onto the ground like Lannister blood. I find a breakfast and a dinner to carry, which I shove into my bag. By now, almost everyone is awake, involved in taking down their own tents or helping other people speed the process along. Pip approaches Jamie. Sam won't get up. He what? He won't get out of his sleeping bag. He told me to fuck off when I tried to wake him. <laughs> Jamie and Pip hurry to Sam's lair. Jamie yells through the tent wall, Get up, Sam! Everyone else is getting ready! Dude, it's not even light outside! Go away! I'm still sore from yesterday! Jamie has now, officially, run out of fucks to give. He unstakes the fly and rips it off the top of the tent. From where I'm standing, I can't see Sam in all of his splendor, but I imagine his facial expression is something between Smeagol's fear and Gollum's anger. Trixie Venture Crew Leader, we hate him! <laughs> we hate him! <laughs> John and I are sitting on the ground, eating our breakfast of trail mix and freeze-dried cardboard, <laughs> when Sam emerges from hibernation. He and Pip dismantle the tent and get ready to go, with everyone staring on. As we trek, Sam tries to keep pace with me, asking, How my feet don't hurt with old beat-up boots like that? They're broken in. What does that even mean? Sam, just leave me alone right now, okay? We hike on at a respectable pace for about two kilometers until Sam starts to beg for a break. <laughs> While we stand, John shows me a new toy that he's bought. It's a stick pen with the ends cut off about eight centimeters long. From his pocket, he pulls out a plastic BB and pops it in his mouth. With the tube concealed in his fist, he fires the pellet at the back of Pip's shoulder with a quiet it doesn't hurt. It's barely perceptible, like a single small raindrop. It's just enough to make someone turn, scratch uncertainly, 
glance to see if anyone tapped them, and then disregard it as if it was nothing. If you're the covert culprit of this spectacle, it is hilarious. <laughs> John pelts Pip a few more times before setting his sights on Sam. He crams a handful of plastic pellets into his cheek, and a hit lands on Sam's lower leg. Sam scrabbles at it, brushes the skin with his foot, and examines the ground. The majority of our morning hike is an uphill climb. The elevation change is gradual, but Sam acts like he's marching the trail of tears, if the tears are saturated with high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> Which in his case, they are. Eventually we cross the stream, we take the opportunity to refill our water, pumping through a filter in our bottles and dropping in iodine tablets. I don't carry bottles though. I just have a camelback with another separate bladder which is sufficiently awkward to fill with a pump designed to screw onto the top of a bottle. So John holds the bladder steady while I pump, occasionally sloshing it at me. Sam, not to be outdone in the chivalry department, rushes to my aid. He grabs the other side of the bladder while I pump and valiantly prevents any sloshing tomfoolery from John. <laughs> Soon Sam realizes that letting the fragile milady do all the work is unacceptable. He wrests the pump from me, leaving me standing like Tom Sawyer while he slowly pumps the water. Of course, pumping three liters of water through a filter is actually a lot of work, and Sam takes frequent breaks to wiggle his arms like wet spaghetti noodles. I try to talk him into giving me the pump, but the chivalry is just too strong with this one. Finally, Jamie saves the day. Sam, is that your camel? No, it's Lady Sabers. Okay, but you need to fill up your own containers. We've got another filter over there. I think Lady Saber can handle her own water pump. I'm trying to be helpful, Jamie. It's great, Sam, but we gotta get going. Come on, fill up. I already have. No, you haven't. How would you know that? Because I've been watching you. I think you've drained your camel and at least one of those water bottles. That's creepy as shit, Jamie. Jamie shrugs. It's my job. Now give Lady Saber the pump and fill your own water. We're all waiting on you. Again. Sam shifts uncomfortably. I haven't emptied my camels. Well, you haven't filled them up either. Come on, Sam. I don't want to water it down. That catches everyone's attention. <laughs> what are you talking about? Jamie pauses. Sam, show me what's in your containers. Sam refuses repeatedly until Jamie snatches one of Sam's bottles from the side pocket of his pack and unscrews the lid. Is this soda? Yeah, so? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, Sam. Is that what's in your camel too? No, that's just sweet tea. At that, <laughs> the adults play the safety card. They talk Sam into pouring out his beetus juice and filling up with water. The rest of the group watches in stunned silence as Sam pours out his levulose libations into the stream. After replacing fizzy sugar syrup with water, Sam's pace improves. <laughs> Sam's pace improves. Surprising. Instead of a crawl, we hike at more of a tired trudge. While the original plan was to eat lunch while fishing, we're now so far behind that we have to walk and eat while we hike up the ridge. We take five minutes on a rocky clearing to admire the view, which is truly spectacular, though I don't remember it quite as vividly as I do Sam's comments. This is kinda lame, huh? No, I actually think it's pretty. <laughs> yeah, me too. I I was talking about, um, the, the uphill hike. Oh. While hiking uphill does suck, I'm in no hurry to let Sam think that his wooing attempts are even remotely successful. It's afternoon by the time we crest the ridge and begin our downhill descent. While we had planned to be well into our fishing by now, We've only covered about 8 kilometers in 5 hours. I think most species of rocks move faster. Thankfully the downhill grade does speed us up. We cover the remaining 4 kilometers in just under 2 hours. Everyone is finally relieved to arrive at the fishing place. One of our adult leaders is the owner of the property so she wastes no time jumping into her talk. Things are fine until she asks, who here is 16 or older? Most hands including mine, Sam's and John's go up. All right, if you're over 16, I'll need to see a fishing license, but then we should be all good to go. We dig into our packs to fish out <laughs> the slips of paper. John and I had gotten ours a week before as part of our greater study of the wild creatures of Walmart. Ooh, that's dangerous. <laughs> when Milady of the Fish reaches Sam, 
things go off the rails like a freight train sideswiping a children's hospital. <laughs> Do you have a fishing license? I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy, but I can't let you fish without a license. But, but don't you, like, own the land? Well, yeah, but I don't own the fish. But I didn't know I would need one. I'm a little fuzzy on the details, but I think that's the same way Jesus turned water into wine. There was an email sent out to everyone. Did you read it? Um, no, my mom did. She didn't tell me. Well, your mom isn't on this trip, buddy. That's your responsibility. I'm real sorry, but there's nothing I can do about that. I like how she passively aggressively calls him buddy. <laughs> That's a good one. We get fishing poles and bait while Sam stews in the grass. John and I find a shady spot on the riverbank. I don't have the patience for fishing, so John lets me try the pellet tube thing. The pellets are biodegradable, so I don't feel too bad about them landing in the river. Of course, that probably also means that they're full of methyl ethyl bad stuff that shouldn't go in your mouth, but oh well. <laughs> I'm a decent shot, but I'm no good at keeping a straight face, nor hiding the tube in my fist. Jamie, my first target, catches on pretty quick and returns fire with some tiny river rocks. <laughs> After an hour or so of not catching anything, John becomes convinced that crickets will serve as better bait. Those little fuckers aren't easy to catch, but when I do get a hold of one, I drop it down the back of his shirt. <laughs> During all this time, Sam is either wandering between different people or sitting on the ground like an angry bump on a spiteful pickle. <laughs> spiteful pickle? Ah, oh, that's too good. <laughs> Eventually, he does make his way to John and I, plopping down next to me with a thud that tips the Richter scale. I don't have much tolerance for one-sided conversation about my stupid fucking mom didn't tell me. So John and I cross to the other side of the river. The water is ankle deep, but our boots are waterproof. From our side of the moat, we watch Sam fee fi fo fumming back and forth along his side of the bank. He keeps busy alienating everyone he talks to with the same conversation topic, removing his fedora to punch it a few times in between. <laughs> The respite I get from Sam lasts a few precious hours, until it's time to cover the remaining distance to our campsite. We turn in our fishing gear and mount our packs. The remaining two kilometers are behind us before the sun sets, and we set up our camp. For dinner, we fill an enormous pot with water, and balance it precariously atop my tiny camp stove. While the water churns to a boil, we dig out our dinner rations and eating utensils. I hadn't paid a lot of attention to the dinner while I repacked it, but now, I take a look at the package dehydrated spaghetti, and Italian meatballs. Fitting. <laughs> Sam's sour mood brightens like a fluorescent bulb as the hot water is poured into the package. It has to sit for a few minutes as the food cooks itself, and Sam looks like he's about to jump out of his skin with excitement. Once it's ready, he dumps the whole bag onto his plate, and Jamie just barely is able to stop him. That's to feed two, Sam! You and your tent mate! Plus, we've got to say grace. Jamie asks me to lead the dinner prayer, even though the only ones I know are in Latin. Sam suffers through it, but contains his euphoria for a noodly reward. <laughs> After begrudgingly allowing Pip to siphon half of his dinner, Sam dives in face first. Suffering through a full day of exercise makes this feeding more obscene than usual. <laughs> it's like shovel feeding a vacuum cleaner attached to a Vitamix blender. John and I eat straight out of the pouch with sporks to avoid dirtying a plate and we've kept our eyes averted to maintain our appetites. <laughs> the open mouth chew smack gulping is still almost too much for me. Ugh. Eventually he does finish, and after the rest of us have scarfed our packaged side items and cleaned our plates, we decide to build a fire. Sam is stoked, heh <laughs> for that too. He scampers to his pack, producing no less than three different fire starters. A flint, a box of matches, and a Zippo lighter. <laughs> Prepared beyond prepared. Jamie rousts us to collect firewood, and getting a dozen well-fed people to hunt in the dusk for sticks is like herding feral cats with a feather duster. An hour later, though, we have a nice-sized fire pile. Our fire ring is the metal rim of an old truck tire half buried in the ground. Jamie and John go to work setting up a log cabin structure of tiny twigs, while Sam eagerly flips his lighter open and closed. Okay, Sam, you want to light it? Go ahead. Sam kneels with his lighter. Hits the striker and nothing. Sparks every time, but a flame never catches. It's not working. 
I just got this stupid thing. Is there fuel in it? Of course there is, it's brand new. Zippos don't come with fuel, Sam. Here, let me take a look. Sam cradles the lighter like his last can of SpaghettiOs. No way, dude. I know how to do it. <laughs> All right, let's see. A minute or two of finagling later, and Sam manages to pull the lighter apart, revealing fuel reserves dry as milady after the tip of a fedora. <laughs> Pip gets a flame to catch with his lighter, and a few of us take turns breathing life into the embers. Soon, a splendid fire is licking away. John and I lean our packs against a nearby tree as a makeshift sofa back. Oh hey, I got a surprise for you. A John surprise is usually something along the lines of an exploding zucchini or two-headed frog, but this is just a Ziploc bag with some stuff in it. Weed! No, even better, it's s'mores! <laughs> I've never done these before, but I'm all about a toasted marshmallow! I pilfer a twig from the fire pile and strip the bark with my knife, skewer the puff ball, and rotate it gently above the flames. Jean sets his on fire, savage, and blows it out only after it develops a black ashy crust. Gross. I let mine get golden brown and crispy. That was OP who's never made s'mores the only one that's doing this right. I don't understand what's up with people burning their marshmallows. Stop it. It's disgusting. <laughs> the graham crackers are crunched a little, but the chocolate is just melty enough to make a mess. We're able to eat about three each before it devolves into just throwing crumbs at each other. Eventually, I can't stand to have melty goop on my hands anymore, so I lick two fingers clean and reach into my pack for a camp towel, but it's not where I usually keep it. Instead, my fingers close around something else, which I gingerly pull out. It's my pocket Bible. My father stuck it in one of my outside pockets when he shipped it. He read it to me as a little girl, and it's pretty much one of the only things that we have in common. There's a little note inside the front cover, and the whole thing makes me teary-eyed and homesick. I tuck under John's arms, and open to the book of Luke, where all of my favorite parables are. Sam spies my 2,000-year-old cartoon, and decides to enlighten Milady with his own euphoric intelligence. You know, the Bible has like thousands of contradictions in it. I don't care, Sam. Well, you should. I mean, you understand what you believe, right? I ignore him, but he still presses. Right? While I'm seething, John steps in. Hey, Sam, this fire's about to die. So? Go throw some fucking wood on it! No, that won't help. It needs a special tool. What? What kind of tool? The left-handed wind shifter. I think it's over there near that pile of crew gear. A few other people sitting around the fire are in on this joke and egg Sam on while I duck to hide my foolish grin. It's about this long, has a handle on one end, and this weird looking thing on the other. Trust me, you'll know it when you see it. Ugh, okay. I'll give you a marshmallow if you find it. <laughs> <laughs> he who exalts himself shall be humbled. Sam jogs the few paces away from the fire to where we've piled our crew gear and shuffles around in the dim firelight, searching for this mythical tool that doesn't exist. What's it look like again? It's long and skinny, with a handle on the end. You'll know it when you see it. John lets fly with a few pellets while those of us still sitting around the fire try not to crack. Even John lets a wry smile slip. Every 30 seconds or so, he'll fire a pellet towards Sam's shape. Hey, are you guys feeling like raindrops? It's probably ticks, Sam. Ticks? Yep, little guys smell ya and just fall out of the trees. You should check yourself and make sure you don't got any hanging on, especially your, you know, equipment. How he keeps a straight face, I will never know. I shove another marshmallow into my mouth so I don't catch the giggles. None of this is more than standard new guy teasing, but most don't eat it up like a bag of Doritos. <laughs> John tosses Sam a marshmallow, and soon everyone's sitting around the fire roasting one. John burns his as a sacrifice to the Red God. I turn mine slowly, getting crispy on the outside and almost melty enough to fall off of the stick before shoving it in my mouth. Sam snickers. Hey, Lady Saber, I bet that's not the only white sticky stuff you swallow. He grins like an idiot at the faces staring back at him. The girls are silently revolted, and only one guy forces a nervous chuckle. Pip has the stone to call him out. Sam, that's nasty! That perfect marshmallow turns to acid as it goes down. John's about to speak up, but I start first. I squeeze John on the thigh, looking straight back at Sam, and say, Yeah, you know what? 
you're absolutely right. Then Sam evaporates, and everyone gives me a hundred dollars percent. What? A hundred percent for being so cool and witty. Okay, that's not what happened. Not outside of my imagination, at least. I considered it before remembering rule number one of neckbeards. Don't feed the spank bank. <laughs> Instead, I spilled my guts like that guy from Saving Private Ryan. Take that back, Sam. <laughs> Why? Because that's fucking gross and it's not funny. Take it back. It's just a joke. Get over it. No, it's not a joke. It's repulsive. Like you. Yeah. I'm so fucking fed up with you, Sam. You follow me around and ruin everything that I enjoy doing. You insult me, and you don't care how I feel about what you say. It's not the venomous hellfire that I had imagined it would be. It's just calm, even-keeled rage. What are you even talking about? I'm so nice to you. I wouldn't have even come here if it wasn't for you. I didn't want you here, Sam. You're not nice to anyone. You're mean to your mother. You're mean to my boyfriend. I don't want to be your friend. Please just leave me alone. My heart is crawling into my throat, and my words are coming out stilted and staccato, but he's taken the hint. For a second, there is a thunderous silence. Sam stands, clenches his fists, and stalks back to his tent without a word. Pip breaks the ice, tossing a stick into the fire. I fucking hate that kid. <laughs> After another hour or so, the rest of us put out the fire and filter off to bed. Most of the adults are already asleep. As I snuggle down into my bag, I can hear Sam's voice carrying through the woods. The walls of the tent might seem snug and secure, but they have zero soundproofing. From this distance, it's hard to make out the words. <laughs> Pip's response is nothing more than a mumble. But it's nice to her. Yeah. Oh, you do just bed. You think you could time? And then Jamie's voice rings out, clear as a bell. Shut the hell up and go to bed! <laughs> the next day is unremarkable. Sam avoids eye contact with me and deliberately keeps his distance all morning. We pack up, hike the short distance back to our cars, and return home right on time. Mrs. Sam waves to me and smiles as they leave the church parking lot. That was mostly the end of my interactions with Sir Sam the Chivalrous for the year. We didn't share any classes, and he stopped going out of his way to see me otherwise. Over the summer, we didn't speak or come into contact, but this was still not the end. Oh boy, that was a long part. I honestly don't know why the, the sticky white stuff comment was the line. You know what I mean? This dude cut you in the face with a sword, but a comment about marshmallows is, is what tips it over the edge. I don't understand. I would have had this outburst like probably five episodes ago at the very least. Because it's exactly what he needs, you know? Little reality check. Nothing wrong with that. I'm glad Jamie seems like a pretty cool, level-headed guy. It seems like everybody would have had a lot more fun if it wasn't for Sam tagging along. Which is sad. <laughs> he ruined everybody's fishing trip, even though he didn't even bring the f fucking fishing permit. He didn't even get to do any fishing. And everybody else got dragged down because he's just a, a lard ass. Much like I thought, that they couldn't keep up with everybody else. Absolutely ridiculous. I do like that little uh, pellet gun thing. <laughs> I would not have stopped hitting Sam with it. And we don't hear a whole lot about John in these stories, but I really like this glimpse into his character where, you know, OP and Sam are about to get into it and he's like, hey, go find that wind shifter or whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> this tool that does not exist. It's totally, you know, standard new guy hazing stuff, but... Sir Sam isn't really clever enough to catch on to that, so he's totally looking for it. 100% because he wants to impress Lady Saber, which is kind of pathetic, but mostly hilarious. <laughs> uh, luckily, he did get peeled off, but mysteriously, there are two more parts to this story. Unfortunately for me, time's running short. I'm not going to be able to shove them into this video. My voice is starting to give out a little bit. I gotta practice up before we start doing like live streams and podcasts and all this stuff. Or else my voice is just gonna get wrecked consistently. Especially after doing the Schmeagle voice and stuff like that. Man, I gotta have liquids on standby to at least try and help myself recover. <laughs> I think this is a, a good point to go out on. Sam mostly left her alone. I've enjoyed the Sir Sam saga pretty well. It's just a bit of innocent fun. All things considered, 
we've seen some really, really dark shit on this channel. So I'm, I'm grateful to have Sir Sam just provide a little bit of levity, you know? Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to academic part one, or why playing dumb is easier than playing smart. Spoilers, there is no part two for this. <laughs> Hello everyone, Lady Saber here, back with the 14th installment of Sir Sam the Chivalrous. For those of you new readers, this story will make no sense without starting at the beginning. Grab some Doritos and strap in, because you'll be here for a while. <laughs> Player one is me, Lady Saber, from the land of always winter. I'm on a sundress kick, finally almost at home in the scorching 100% humidity that is the American South. Player two is still, somehow, Sir Sam, our sandaled, smooth-cheeked neckbeard friend zone. Any weather is perfect weather for cargo shorts and sandals. Sam has grown out his hair during the summer as a shield from the dangers of the outdoors. Player three is Mr. Teacher, my English teacher. This is the same teacher who taught English the previous year as well as hosted Go Club. It's not uncommon for teachers, especially of advanced placement students, to follow a cohort from year nine to year 12. We're good friends, he's a bro, and he is well aware of Sam's chivalry. <laughs> This tale begins at the beginning of the school year. Towards the end of the summer, John and I had a huge fight that left us in that we're not really broken up, but we're also not together space while we handle our problems like grown-ups by not speaking to each other. Aw, oh, tragedy. The first days of lunch are always awkward. None of the clubs are open. None of the upperclassmen have off-campus lunch passes yet. And none of the freshmen have any idea what the fuck they're supposed to do. <laughs> The indoor lunchroom is a cacophonous echo chamber of angst and hormones, while the outdoor courtyard is empty because it's raining. <laughs> My group of friends have been boxed out of a table, so we pack tightly in a circle against the wall. Soon enough, I spot Sam and his brony cronies. <laughs> They've just exited the lunch line and are standing around, just shoving each other uncertainly, <laughs> the way that boys do when they aren't sure what happens next. Sam spots me and tries to herd his group in my direction, the way that one might herd feral cats with a feather duster. While it's loud in the lunchroom, I can still pick up a bit of the conversation. Yeah, I'm gonna fuck the shit with girls. Do we need up, gate? Is it my cooties? I've been a specialist about that. They're not contagious. Sam's fedora faction eventually does follow his lead. While his group tries to ignore ours existence, and we try to ignore their smell, Sam and I are practically shoulder to shoulder. Hey, Lady Saber. I shove a bite of food into my mouth so that I'll have an excuse not to talk. I just wave. Sam continues staring at me while he cracks open an overfull lunchbox. Thanks, Mom! <laughs> and a Dr. Pepper that could only be described as American size. See? Dr. Pepper, dude! I posted a poll recently that said, After Mountain Dew, what are the next most popular neckbeard drinks? Next was energy drinks like Monster Red Bull. And third was Dr. Pepper. It's science. <laughs> I like your dress, Lady Saber, he says, looking at me like a kid in a museum who really wants to touch the art. Mm-hmm. I hate being talked to when my mouth is full. As I go for another bite, Sam says, Keep going. Forced giggle.mp3. <laughs> huh? Oh, for fuck's sake. I'm eating a banana. I shoot back a well-practiced withering stare and put the fruit down. Sam adjusts himself nervously and opens the first container in his lunch. The smell of stale pasta sauce ah, takes me back. <laughs> Sam starts a shoveling like a Canadian, asking me around two mouthfuls for the price of one. What class is I'm taking this semester? I don't respond. Here, take a look at mine. Sam holds out his schedule for me to examine. I just want to eat, Sam. For those of you taking notes, what I really meant by that was, I want to see your schedule up close. Sam holds the paper higher and closer and higher and closer until it's clear that he's going to press it against my nose. <laughs> the whole time he's giggling to himself as if this is the single funniest joke in the world. With that, I put in my earbuds and shuffle my angry playlist. Bring Me the Horizons It Never Ends has some fitting lyrics. Hey, are you okay? I've said it once! I'm fine, Sam. Are you sure? You seem mad about something. I've said it twice! I said, I'm fine. It just seems like I've said it a 
thousand fucking times! Sam, I just want to eat, okay? He turns his attention to his friends for the rest of lunch, and when the bell rings, we go our separate ways. Mercifully, seeing none of each other for the rest of the day. We share no classes, don't cross paths, life is good, right? <laughs> Two days later, Sam strides into my AP English class and eyes me with a shit-eating grin. Hey, Randy Saber! He declares triumphantly, plopping right down in the seat next to me. I got myself switched into this class. All this was going to be way too easy. <laughs> Those people are on a lower level. You know, upstairs. <laughs> at the bell, Mr. Teacher rises from his desk to take attendance. He starts at seeing Sam. Most of us were all in the same English class last year as well as the year before. Sam, I uh, didn't see you on my roster. <laughs> I just got switched in here from otter's level. He slouches back into the chair like a boy king who's just ascended the Iron Throne. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Mr. Teacher glances at me and catches the look of desperation on my face. Would you mind sliding up into this seat for me? There's one other empty seat in the whole classroom, and it's only two rows in front of me, but beggars can't be choosers. What? Why? Sam whines. It'll help me take attendance. Eh, but I'm already sitting here. Mr. Teacher doesn't respond, but the look on his face gives a very strong I'm not asking again vibe. And Sam quickly caves, sauntering to his new seat while grumbling to himself. Mr. Teacher dives into the lesson, and as he goes through the text, Sam turns to look at me repeatedly, always playing it off by checking at the clock. Smooth as sandpaper. <laughs> It's not long before we're given a short writing assignment. The prompt is, what period in history or setting in a work of fiction would you travel to, and why? I'm sure you're all totally stumped on my topic of choice. We're given 20 minutes. The idea is to just free write, getting ideas onto the paper without being bogged down in editing or stressing over minor details. I hammer out a page and a half before the time is up. Mr. Teacher calls on a few students to read out loud, and soon enough, it's my turn. Yo. My palms are sweaty, knees weak, accent heavy. <laughs> I've got a lot written. Just the first paragraph is fine. So off I stumble, tripping over anything that starts with H. I didn't expect to read, so I'm a little more than self-conscious about using the word Westeros out loud. <laughs> I finish, sit, and lock eyes with Sam, who's locked eyes with my waist, still slouching with an arm draped over the back of his chair. The most interesting man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad, he says with a chuckle. <laughs> no one laughs. A few of my classmates raise their hands and give me ideas or corrections to make. Sam, let's hear what you got, teacher says with an amiable smile. Well, no, I, I didn't write much. Then it'll go quick. Come on. Mr. Teacher is not the type to take no as an answer from students very well. Sam frets in his seat before rising to read. I transcribed his paragraph in shorthand, and it's still in my English notebook. In history, there's a single day that changed the United States. During this time, the sleeping military giant, who was not ranked that high, went on a course to become the most powerful nation for its time. The day that Pearl Harbor was bombed is the day that I would like to go back to. This class counts towards college English credit. You, dear reader, may make of this what you will. The room is quiet. Mr. Teacher is indecipherable. Thank you, Sam. Uh, for homework, hash out your first paragraph and a thesis statement. We'll go over them tomorrow. As we leave to the tone of the bell, Sam catches up with me. Hey, Lady Saber. What's a thesis? <laughs> <laughs> The American education system strikes again, bro. <laughs> oh, no. What's a thesis? Bro, I'm pretty sure I learned that in, like, freshman English. Jesus. I guess Sam is just too focused on relentlessly stalking this exchange student uh, and coming up with hilarious jokes about eating a banana. Wow. I'd hate to see how he gets around a popsicle or a hot dog. <laughs> As they said in Superbad, all the best foods are shaped like dicks. <laughs>
I have a lot of questions about how Sam actually ended up in the AP class. I mean, I guess he was an honor, so he might be decent at creative writing or something like that, but <laughs> maybe it's just another case of, you know, American education failing everybody all around, including the people that actually want to learn. I'm quite sad to be getting to the end of Sir Sam's stories, honestly. <laughs> He's just like the lord, the mega lord of innocent cringe. We talk about some cringy stuff on my channel that's like absolutely horrible in the cringe department, but Sir Sam's just kind of innocuous and let's be honest, he's dumber than a box of hair, but <laughs> that's kind of what makes me endeared to him, you know? I would not wish more encounters on Lady Saber, but if Sir Sam got a social media account, <laughs> if we found his Instagram, I'd be pretty okay with that. Anyways, let's get into the last Sir Sam story that has been posted. <sighs> All good things must end. So many friends going away recently, but we've got to face it head on. So let's get into it. <laughs> Sir Sam the Chivalrous tries to lifting, or how I almost became a quadriplegic. Story number 15 coming at you live. <laughs> Trigger warning for major cringe content and Russell Jimmy's. New readers start here. Edited for freedom units. <laughs> For clarity, I'm going to rehash our player's descriptions. Player 1 is me, Lady Saber, 17 at the time, one year into my two-year exchange program from Belgium. I'm very short and very blonde, a lifelong fencer, and neckbeard spoosh. My coaches recommend a weightlifting regimen to help me break through some plateaus in training, so John and I pick it up together. At the time of this tale, we've been lifting together for about six months. Player 2 is John, my swole mate. <laughs> I like that. A good old boy with a temper and a dry sense of humor, despite also being an athlete, he's never done much serious lifting. As a 1.8 meter, 5 foot 10 inches manlet, he's made real gains during our six months in the gym. He pushes me almost as hard as I push him. Player three is Sir Sam, the whitest and most chivalrous knight of all the land. Often mistaken for Shamu. <laughs> Typically wears cargo shorts, the wrong kind of graphic tee, and sandals. His adiposity has doomed him to be a babyface, and his squeaky voice could make a WD-40 commercial. The fedoras, remarkably, have become rarer. Definitely does not lift anything heavier than a cheeseburger, making him an expert in all things gym. There will be a lot of fitness terminology tossed around here, and I will try to define it throughout, but if something is confusing, just ask in the comments. This story takes place a few weeks after the previous. John and I are doing better. Lifting together helps. My fencing gym, a small part of a much larger complex, has a large weight and machine room, so John and I go there three days a week after school. Because I'm paying for fencing, the gym access is free, and John gets in cheap for having a student ID. At lunch, I sit with a small group in the library to work on a project, which mostly involves chatting in the presence of open books. <laughs> Sam has followed me here, but what else is new? Our table's quite out of the way, so he can't get close and stay close without being extremely conspicuous. Instead, he opts for the stealthier option. <laughs> Walking back and forth nearby while constantly dropping things. It's like watching James Bond after a traumatic brain injury. <laughs> oh, barbell. Standard 20 kilogram, 2.2 meters, 45 burgers, 7 feet. It's a long Olympic bar used for exercises involving two hands. The center portion is knurled to provide better grip. That afternoon, my host mother drives me straight from school to the gym. I change into my workout clothes and start on the squat rack, warming up with just the bar. As I'm finishing my last rep, Sam strides up behind me in the mirror and taps my shoulder. Hey, Lady Saber! <laughs> I feel the color drain from my face as I re-rack the bar. I didn't know you came here. I thought you just fenced. I've never seen you here before either, Sam. I take a moment to examine his getup. Fingerless gloves, mid-calf socks, running shoes, and a big World if zombies chase us, I'm crimping you shirt with jean shorts. <laughs> Everything was okay, I guess, until we got to the jean shorts. <laughs> He's also carrying a big gulp large enough to bludgeon an elephant. Well, I'm here practically all the time. Really? I have never seen you. Yeah, well, I don't come here after school when it's all crowded like this. I come in the morning. 
before school. Yeah. At 6 a.m. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, why are you doing that with just the bar? He laughs. Aren't you going to add any weight? <laughs> Come on, even I can... I'm just warming up, I reply, turning on my heel towards the weight tree. Sam dives in front of me, grabbing hold of a kettlebell and a resistance band. Don't worry, Lady Saber. I got it for you. What? What are you doing with those, Sam? You said you were adding weights, right? You tie this around and hang it on each side. Duh. No way. <laughs> no way he is this stupid. No way anybody is this stupid. <laughs> I ignore him, walking to the opposite side of the bench press, pull a 10 kilogram, 25 burger plate off the weight tree. Oh, that works too. Not the way I do it, but whatever. Sam says, dropping the kettlebell on the floor and scampering to me, making to wrestle the weight from my hands. I can get that for you. I got it. You sure? It, it looks heavy for you. He says as I raise it to chest height and load it onto the bar. I'll get the other one, he proclaims, power walking back to the weight tree, grabbing a 15 kilo, 35 burgers plate, and heaving it over back to the squat rack. <laughs> nice and unbalanced. That's not the right weight, Sam. What? Oh, shit. Well, you didn't tell me which one to grab, he squeals. I retrieve a 10 kilo plate while he unloads the 15 kilo one and lays it on the floor. Sam, would you put it back where you got it? What? Why? Because mom isn't here mostly. Fine, I'll get it. No, 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 I'll get it for you, don't worry. I consider approaching the rack when I spot Sam in my periphery staring at me. Nope, no way I am about to make a deposit into that wank bank. <laughs> I backpedal to the opposite wall and sink into the bench seat. Sam's disappointment is palpable. What's wrong? I'm resting. But you've hardly done anything. You rest between sets, Sam. He stares back blankly. Finally, John arrives, striding through the double doors and up to me. Sam is suddenly overcome with a great thirst, beating a hasty retreat to the water fountain. Where the fuck have you been? Well, I didn't want to get here early and spoil y'all's date or nothing. Would you be a deer and fetch me a cyanide pill? <laughs> I'm gonna go change out. I hope you two can make it work. He seems like the one for you. John pokes my nose with a playfully straight face before turning to leave for the lockers. Before long, he's back and we start our workout together. I was hoping to set a new personal record, squatting one plate today, but as I finish my warm-up sets with Sam still lurking nearby, my heart just isn't in it. One plate is one 20 kilo plate on each side of the bar, totaling 60 kilos, 135 burgers. John and I switch to the bench press taking turns lifting and spotting each other between motivational insults. Sam orbits nearby, watching me and repeating whatever John says. Come on, babe, you fucking got this. Push, push, push. Yeah, little Sam, well, you got this. Push, push, push. <laughs> Overhead presses follow and then pull-ups. With each set, Sam drifts further and further away, staring at the dumbo rack and ending far out of sight among the machines leaving a trail of scattered gear in his wake. <laughs> Eventually we split apart. John works on curls and a few other accessory lifts while I find a treadmill. Seeing an opportunity, Sam trips over himself to get on the treadmill next to me, hurriedly punching buttons until it starts moving at a waddling pace. <laughs> I fall into a rhythm of about four and a half minutes per kilometer, like seven minutes per mile, trying to enjoy the brush of blood to my head and ignore the smell of sweaty Doritos. <laughs> Sam is determined to impress my lady with a feat of alpha male physical superiority. So he ups his pace to a gentle jog. <laughs> the thumping of his feet tips the Richter scale. So, had a good workout? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Within two minutes, Sam's sweating enough to be in a Gatorade commercial and asks if I want to take a break. I don't respond, but he pushes on for another 60 seconds before quitting, panting something about hydration. <laughs> John stops by before leaving, changed and freshly showered. He offers to babysit, but I'm almost finished myself. He gives me a possessive goodbye kiss with an arm wrapped around my waist. Sam does not rejoin me at the treadmill. 
After slightly less than half an hour, I finish and head for the lockers, pausing by the weight room. You know what? Screw it. I rest for a spell before warming up once more with the bar and then loading directly to one plate. Like a glitchy arcade whack-a-mole, Sam reappears in a jiffy, <laughs> sulking in the distance to watch the show. I take a deep breath, get under the bar, and unrack the weight. It is heavy, but not unmanageable. I lower, riding it to the ground, watching in the mirror for my hips to drop below my knees, exhaling slowly as I push back up. One. Again. Down. And again. Up. Two. Fuck it. I'm doing it. Down. Up. Three. Sam's inching closer. <laughs> Arms crossed, turning in circles occasionally, starting to sheepishly cheer me on. Down. Up. My squads are screaming through number four, and I felt my knees wobble. One more. Come on. Now or never. Yay. Go, Lady Sabre. <laughs> Sam cheers as I lower for number five. It's now or never. He seizes the opportunity with a hearty, Go get him! And he smacks my ass. Oh, Jesus. I suppress a scream, leaning forward in shock. As I stand, the barbell clangs against the underside of the catches on the rack. My eternal savior springs to my aid, circling to the left to lift one side of the bar into place. This throws me off balance, and the angle causes the bar to slide sidelong off my shoulders. I tumble sideways until the bar slams into the ground, and I crumple to my knees under the weight. What a show. <laughs> oh, shit! Lady Saber, I was just try. Now, I really scream. I can't find English words, but French pours out like molten iron. Just go fuck yourself, you useless fucking idiot! Get the fuck away from me! The back of my neck feels like it's been set on fire. I've drawn the attention of everyone in our area code. <laughs> I probably did too, just screaming that. And one of the personal trainers sprints over, frantically hoisting the bar off of my fucking spine. Ma'am, are you alright? I nod, curling my arms around my head, tears hot against my face, while Sam just stands there and blubbers mindlessly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> she just fell, and the bar slid, and I... I saw exactly what happened, buddy. Stay right there. The PT takes me off the floor and walks me to the medic while blood just sheets down my back. Sam trails grimly. He sits paralyzed in the office, getting chewed out by the trainer while the gym's medic patches me up and writes an incident report. While the wound was a mess, it was mostly superficial and healed without scarring. Sam never admitted to it, but he was banned from the gym and all of their subsidiaries. Wasn't he banned from the gym before? Or was it just the fencing classes? I guess it's just fencing, but they're like, yeah, you can still come to the gym. We want your money, son! until he almost paralyzes one of their fucking customers, and then they're like, oh shit, <laughs> that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Get that kid out of there. It is no exaggeration that Sir Sam is just a walking lawsuit. <laughs> if I wanted to make a million dollars, I would just follow this kid around and be like, I hope I'm the victim. I don't understand why you would volunteer to, to spot somebody if you've never really even set foot into a gym before. You don't know how to spot that girl. Just leave her alone, damn it. <laughs> but he can't help himself. He just wanted to be the hero and ended up screwing everything up yet again. I assume at some point, you know, Lady Saber went back to Belgium, which is why we haven't had any more Sir Sam stories. But I'm sure other people have had interactions with him. They're somewhere out there. We just uh, need to find them and wring more Sir Sam stories out of them. <laughs> Ah, uh, unfortunately, this is the last that I know of Sir Sam for now. But hey, it's been a hell of a ride, and I definitely appreciate you guys taking it with me. Additionally, I would be extremely grateful if you would like, comment, and or subscribe. Maybe share the video around if you should like. That is always appreciated. Additionally, I hope you'll check out the links warm in the description. There are some things there that weren't on the splash page in the beginning of the video, including my Patreon, and you are seeing some of my amazing Patreon patrons on the screen right now, and I would like to thank them all, but especially Lady Nix, Robert Waits, Pope Squid, Rebecca H, Cider Drinker, Tato Ferret, The Last Shinobi, Mark211, Michael Undead, Aaron W, Mish, John Hero, Josh K, Candy Sora. I almost did it without taking a breath. <laughs> almost. 
Oh, it's it's getting to be so many of you guys, and I am super, super appreciative. If anybody else would like to donate, that is obviously massively appreciated as well. But if you can't right now, don't have the means, don't worry about it at all. I just appreciate you coming on through and hanging out with me today. And I hope that you come back and hang out with me again tomorrow. In order to do so, you'll need to keep yourself safe out there. Definitely wash your hands. It's super important. But also, take some time out and do something that you enjoy today. Something just for yourself. Maybe it's watching another Red X video. But honestly, most importantly, I hope that you will always remember that you are loved, you are worthy, and you definitely, definitely deserve it. I'll see you in the next one, friends. And until then, bye-bye.